I know that this is a long time ago, <laughs> but about basic training. Or at least first I want to talk about what's your first contact with the fire service? Like when you when you go back way, way back, what's your first contact with? Okay, so my first contact with the fire service was um, growing up. My father was a firefighter, and so I had a daily um, interaction with that, I suppose, growing up in my own house. So um, Where his firehouse, work? yeah, he, he was a firefighter, and he didn't work that far from home. So on occasion, I went to the firehouse. I don't think that many times, but I do remember going there as a, as a young child, yeah. you know, yeah. Were you like, was it always a dream job or was this, was this something nope. that came late? Nope. Nope. Was not my dream job at all. Um, <laughs> truth be told, I had to kind of be forced to take the test. Uh, I was probably 17 or so when I took the test and then FDMY test is three segments. There's the written test that you take and uh, then there's a physical agility test. And then of course, They have a me uh, medical exam for mm -hmm. you to take once you progress through all these stages. But um, I had taken the written, done very well on the written, um, was practicing for the physical because there was a lot of um, obstacles to uh, to do for the physical. It basically was like an obstacle course. Yeah. It wasn't quite like um, the gladiator or uh, I forget what those <laughs> things, the tough mutter. It's not necessarily that. <laughs> But it was it was interesting. They yeah. had um, they had a uh, a pull up bar to hang from, and once your arms were fully extended, that was your time. And if you didn't get a minute, you failed. Oh, so wow. you had to get a minute on that. And the better you did, the more time you, the better your mark. Yeah. We had an eight foot wall. We had a scale. You could run up to it and hit it and try and climb over it. And there was a some sort of a it was what they called a ledge hang where basically you put a an air pack on and there was a board so many inches away from a wall yeah. you basically had to shuffle across to one end and then come back again as fast as you could without falling off so there were a lot of like odd carry a dummy yeah. you know weighted dummy up a flight of stairs turn around come down put it down all, all these physical activities that they had And uh, that was the test. They had a mile run. Um, so all of that was graded into your your written exam and your physical exam. And that gives you basically a number on which to get hired. So my number was 3,000 something. And um, so I had to wait probably two two years at least, two and a half years. I'm not really sure. I forget exactly the timetable there but uh i was going to college at the time and then i worked at uh one of the major networks here in in the united states at cbs and um so i wasn't it was in my back pocket but i wasn't looking necessarily to jump right into it i wanted to try broadcasting and it turns out i didn't have the greatest job there but <laughs> i had like a started <laughs> job so it wasn't that great so On the encouragement of my father, I said, all right, you know what, I'll try it out. And then uh, that was that. Uh, I loved it. And um, I really, you know, I enjoyed it. It was uh, camaraderie was good. Um, you know, uh, the more the longer I stayed, the, lo the more I got out of it. And then uh, eventually it really, really took over my life, so to speak. But uh, initially I was just an average uh, firefighter going through everything. I mean, I was interested, of course, but... And then eventually I became even more interested in what was actually going on around me and what was available to me. And I guess some of that was brought on by some of the people that I worked with uh, who I kind of mentored off of, which I worked with some pretty famous people within the FDNY and uh, so and, you know, and beyond that, beyond FDNY, some people like uh, Vincent Dunn, a famous deputy chief who wrote a lot of textbooks and, uh, you know, had some seminal work on collapse and, and these types of things. And I worked with him and, uh, you know, got to see how he operated. And also there was always that with all the chiefs. I worked in a firehouse that I always worked in a firehouse that had a chief, uh, not by design, just the way it turned out. So you get to meet a lot of experienced uh, chief officers and, see how they operate and see what's 
what they need from from their troops and their company officers. So it opens up your eyes a lot as to another level of the job before you get there, if you get there. So um, I would say some of those people were very interesting. I worked with some chiefs who had done a lot of work in high rise uh, work. And at that time, I came on in the early 80s. I came on in 81, 1981. So there were a lot of people that high rise was really, really kind of, you know, obviously it wasn't in in its infancy, but in a way it was um, with firefighting for sure. New York City had experienced uh, several big high rise fires back in those days. And um, it was it was a new animal for for all of us. And I worked in Midtown Manhattan, so I was exposed on a daily basis to high rise. In fact, um, two blocks in the firehouse is the, uh, is the Empire State Building. And I wasn't working the one day, but they had a, a fifth alarm there at a fire on like the 50th floor. And, you know, some things went on there. Um, early indications of uh, flow path and, and uh, fire towers and how how uh, smoke and fire will move to a low pressure area or, and uh, all this stuff was going on. And only now I think are people kind of paying attention and fully understanding some of these things or trying to at least. So well, let me, I, want, I want to get back to it, but let me, before we get too far. Um, so was it your dad that, that got you into the fire service that made you do the tests or? Yes. He, yeah. At least he, he made you do the tests at least. He basically said, you know, it was a good idea to have this in your back pocket. Yeah. And, uh, and most of the most of the people I grew up with, um, they didn't all go into civil service, but a lot of them tested for the police department or the fire department or, yeah. or both or a lot of different things just so that they had that uh, in case the job market wasn't looking that good. Um, these these things at least give you an option. So. You know, I, uh, I knew a lot of people who became uh, either cops or firefighters, and that was sort of how how it was. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he definitely encouraged me to do that. But uh, in the end, it was my choice. And then uh, after being there, I realized that I made a good choice. You know, so I, mean, I, I never had a dream job of joining the fire service. It was just I did my military service as an airport firefighter, civilian duty. And, and it's kind of I, – I, even after that, I didn't have a – you know, like a, a goal to be a firefighter. It was just somebody I did the military service with who said, well, hey, just, you know, you can join this this great profession here. It's an awesome right. hour, work hours, you know, yeah. good job, nice pay. Like, you should do it. And I'm like, oh, it sounds sweet. Right. <laughs> so oh. me either. I never had, because I, unlike you, I didn't have any connections to it. I had nobody in my presence that was a firefighter. It's not been a... It wasn't part of the radar at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like if I look, if I looked at a, a sheet of paper, what all the jobs it could be, firefighter wasn't probably in there because it was just <laughs> never thought about it. But I want to get back to you. So just just a short one on on you talked about the the recruit. Oh, sorry, the, the testing process about physical exams and so on. Did you think the the tests you met, made back then in eighty one, the physical test? Do you think it made sense? Uh, yes, really good, good it, it, some, of it, some of it made sense. Some of it wasn't strictly uh, job related, though. I think they've tried to make the the test now in the United States. For the most part, now it's called CPAT is the test you take. And it's standardized throughout the country. So there's some restrictions on that. It's very, yeah. um, you know, restrictive in in some of the things you uh, can get a failure mark for. It's very tight like that. But they try and incorporate a lot of the skill sets firefighters will use in the future um and uh you know our test was unique to new york city it wasn't yeah. a standard test anywhere um I, I thought it was fine but it was challenged in the courts and uh we eventually changed it and now we're using basically cpat the national okay. uh the basic national standard test for firefighters throughout the united states so you know uh passing the test is no guarantee of uh, being yeah. a good firefighter, but no. <laughs> there has to be a way to whittle out people, and I get it. You know, there yeah. has to be some way to uh, to do that, and uh, that sometimes it's done on the entrance exam. Sometimes it's done within the recruit school. Yeah, you know. 
So I had a I had an interesting one. I'm, we're not going to dive into this deep, but I had an interesting one. I was in Spain, and there was a guy telling me about the recruitment process of police officers in Spain. I don't know if there was national in Spain, it was part of Spain, or but anyway, you so you you did a, a recruit process just to, it's, for a sort of firefighter. Then you go into recruit school, and by like two or three weeks, all the recruits can vote on the the like the five people they most want to work with in the future and most don't want to work with in the future and the people who are at the bottom with you know most people say they don't want to work with them they just get kicked out for no you know no questions asked that's just get rid of them and the same happens when they leave recruit school and go out on the job everyone they go through like a half a year a year to go like on probation Mm -hmm. uh, all the police officers, handlers they have to work with also grade all their recruits or you know, new, new probies. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom just goes out without anything. I've never heard about that, but that's, that's, I really like it. I would love to have it like that, but <laughs> you know, we're, in, we're also in, in sad face country where you can't do anything to make anyone sad. So, <laughs> so you can't, so everyone gets to be everything they want with a rainbow. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be awesome. I think that would, if I would add something, I would add that. Uh, otherwise, it seems like all the recruit process I see in all the world, nobody's happy with them. <laughs> well, sometimes I, I think that because um, our probation period is a year, yeah. uh, typically a year for the firefighter. Yeah. And uh, I always warn that you watch out for what they do on day 366. Yeah. Because have they just been waiting to, to uh, lay on that couch? Have they just been waiting to uh, use the weight room whenever they feel like it? What what have yeah. they been waiting on? What have they yeah. been acting their way through the past year? And uh, that month 13 can be very telling. <laughs> Should be like the silent weeks after after probation. That's where yeah, you know, yeah. the secret is. See what is. you're really, really all about. Mm -hmm. If you do it badly, then you're placed on a station far out and nobody hears of you again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Or we just work on you more. Yeah. Um, no, that's the thing. So, so when you uh, you did the recruit, uh, 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 so you would call into the recruit school. So how much do you remember of recruit school? Is it, is it like um, a fire training? Is it a, For me, it's just blank almost. It's very little I can remember. Yeah, there's certain things I remember of it. Of course, I, I couldn't go through the whole day and explain everything we did no. it was a long time ago. But um, uh, I went for about, I'm going to say it was about six six to eight weeks, maybe. Um, did you do, did you do that before you went on uh, before the station? Before I went to firehouse, yes. Yeah, just n nothing before that. You, you've never put your foot basically on a, on a fire truck before no. you're going to recruit school. No, no, not at all. In fact, um a lot of our training, we had um, these yellow slickers, basically like raincoats that we wore for most of the uh, class yeah. until we got outfitted with uh, what was at that time turnout coats, three quarter yeah. and three quarter boots. So that was the that was the uniform, uh, the work, uh, yeah. the uh, bunk, no bunker gear. That was the turnout gear that we wore. And um, but during during the classes. Most of the time you had this like slicker just to protect you from the water. And yeah. I guess you wore a coat underneath that I forget. But, um, you know, some things I remember, they took us on a field trip to uh, the South Bronx, which had a tremendous amount of um, burned out buildings. And I was in a big class. We had 300 students, oh, wow. 300 recruits at one time. They still do big classes like that. And um, that year, I think we were the fourth class of the year. So they put through 1,200 oh, new firefighters <laughs> in the year. That's a lot. That's and uh, I remember going to that. Uh, it was probably a, a, a vacant H-type, big six-story apartment house. And using the tools, cutting with the saw, getting an opportunity to actually, you know, do these uh, things in a real building yeah. was kind of cool. I do remember that. They took us up there by bus. Um but other than that, um, you know, instructors being tough and then towards the end kind of, you know, relaxing, realizing yeah. that, OK, these these kids are going to make it through and uh, kind of letting their guard down. And then, you know, having a celebratory party afterwards with the instructors at a at a hall somewhere, you know, just kind of 
you know, they have to discipline you hard yeah. because, uh, you know, that's the way it is. They need you to just follow their instructions so you learn better. But um, after that, then you get put into the real world, which is uh, <laughs> responding on a fire truck. So what uh, did you do? You know, if uh, do you do you any live fire training during recruit school? Uh, you know, uh, when you say live fire training, I don't I don't recall if we did, to be honest with you. I remember mm -hmm. going into what they called the smokehouse. Um, but um, my memory beyond that is not that great. Um, they spent a lot of time uh, on scaling ladders. Yeah. And um, not that that was a primary ladder, but that was kind of used, I believe, to challenge your fear of heights yeah. because they would put a, a safety belt around you and tell you to stand on the ladder and lay back, lean back without holding on just to sort of see how you would deal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, how you would deal with that. So I've seen it um, on videos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. confidence, yeah so that, confidence. We drill. did all that. That was not an easy ladder to move up and down, uh, but they would have you move it from window to window and climb up it. And uh, so I guess it was there to, uh, that might've been a thing that cut people out of the program. I really don't know, but um, you know, the, how much live fire, I don't know, because even to this day, it's difficult to put 300 people through live oh, fire. Wow. It's a lot. Oh wow! It, it can be done. It is done. But it is it is a difficult and uh, it's very difficult on the instructor yeah. cadre because uh, they have to work several days to do that and it's a yeah. lot of work. So what do you remember? Do you remember anything about like fire behavior training? Fire behavior training, like understanding fire or fire dynamics. Uh, yeah, probably very rudimentary. Um, I don't think there was a tremendous amount except for what. We might have had in our books. It was uh, was always warnings about foam rubber mattresses uh, yeah. relighting up on you if exposed to air. We had a lot of things that um, were good information, but they weren't necessarily linked together. Yeah. I think one of the biggest outcomes with the UL study has been putting some of the pieces together for us in the fire service, and um, I would say. Previous to that, there was information, but it wasn't necessarily all linked. Was there a disconnect? Because in my my, if I look back on on my, when I look at my failures or the failures from me teaching, one thing that's been very clear the last five years, at least, when I look back, was um, how bad I was and how bad the instructors for me was of saying what the practical implication is of a lot of theory, of a lot of things. Like if you say auction to a, a foam address um, can be bad, it, it can ignite. Okay, what's the practical use of that? You know, should should I close the door? Should I wet the address before? Should I don't pick the address up at all? Like all these, you get a lot of information, but not necessarily what's the right action connected to the, whatever information. Was that part of a problem, or was it that it wasn't? No, linked no, to, we had like... information. We had some guidelines on some of these things. Um, using that analogy again, the foam uh, thing. What they had experienced was people taking mattresses out of uh, apartments, typically, yeah. and maybe bringing them into an elevator, and they didn't have them tied up, and the fire wasn't ex out all the yeah. way, and they were basically finding out that these things would light up again. And sometimes rather ferociously. So they cautioned about a doing a bad day that. with a burning mattress in the elevator. And, yeah, I mean, and they, no they, learned, they learned a lot. <laughs> they probably learned a lot yeah. of things the hard way. Yeah, um, absolutely. But they had information on things like our ventilation. We had a thing for years called Vent for Life, Vent for Fire. Um, so we had a lot of things that were around, but I just don't think, you know, like the coordinated attack, let's just say. Yeah. Some people who, you know, New York City Fire Department's a big fire department. Oh, yeah. You know, there are five boroughs in in the city of New York. And there are there are uh, SOP, standard operating procedures for the whole fire department. And every firefighter learns what they are for the different buildings and basically understands the game plan 
So that allows them to work citywide, wherever they need to work. They have a general idea of how it's going to how it's going to occur, which is good. But of course, there are always some um, local things that come into play, whether it be um, experiences that other places have had that haven't basically translated throughout the job. In other words, um, maybe some companies do something a certain way and maybe it's even a better way, but it hasn't necessarily been written down and given to everyone else. These are some of the things that can happen locally. So um, I think some of this stuff, um, while uh, a standard operating procedure is great, we also have to think about, you know, these variations that occur. And a lot of times I think some people were seeing things that maybe weren't being brought to bear for the whole job. You know, if you, if you do high rise fires, the people in a high rise area might hear what, what happened, but necessarily getting that out to other people might be a little difficult. And the same is true in private homes, fires, uh, things that they might be doing that are working or maybe they have to modify something that they, they were doing. So years ago, not that many years ago, actually, we had a change in procedure officially regarding um, lower floor fires entering in on the first floor and going to the cellar or basement level below. And uh, we in the FDNY used uh, basically we are an egress um protection hose line strategy that's basically what we always use is protect the egress so what we had in some of these places was the main egress above to go up above so basically the line would go upstairs to come downstairs to protect everything yeah. you know you go above yeah. something to go down to it yeah so that's kind of changed a bit to direct access instead of going up to come down just go straight in yeah um, I know in my area, we had been following a straight in strategy for years because we found that the going up to go down was t wasted time and basically made it harder. And it was easier to just get in there and get on that fire. And then what happens is then egress can sometimes be taken care of by that. But you have to understand how a fire department operates. You know, they, they, we are basically in, our egress protection is number one for us. And the majority of times that works out very well because the egress that we're trying to protect is the main entrance to the house and also multiple dwellings. So, you know, multifamily, uh, multi-floored buildings, things like that. Yeah. So if, if you like working in a, like you say, a huge fire department, 15,000 people, um, and you have at least some people trying to write an SOP going, we want to go in that direction. Some people agree, some people don't agree, of course. Mm -hmm. um, is there a difference between today and back going back 20 years or, or even further in, in like how people view like compliance, like do what, do what it says? Well, we, we kind of, we are, we are pretty good with that. Um, basically they call it the book, whatever the book says. So yeah. usually, um, if there's a guideline in the book, obviously people use it to study, to understand, you know, future yeah. officers have to study the book, firefighters read it and it is updated. It's a living document. It's not just stagnant. It gets changed quite a bit. There's a lot of documents and they do get looked at and tweaked here and there. And then, of course, they sometimes they get rewritten. Um, so one of the things I would say is that, yes, there is some stuff that makes the books and changes things, but it's a long process. It's a very long process. And that's OK, because we have to be careful that we're not um, stopping and starting in different directions all the time. That doesn't necessarily help an organization either. So for something to change, something kind of big, a big change to be made. It has to be vetted pretty well, and it's not just going to be opinion based. We have to we have to try and provide some case study with that as well, because if it's just theoretical, that's a hard sell. 
Well, and, and I think that's, I think theory is the, is the starting point, but you have to have, have to have a thought about something you do, but then you have to, like you say, you have to, it has to make sense in practice too. Um, it's, um, I usually say that the, the introduction of fire protection years in, in Swedish fire service was the best and the worst that happened to the fire service <laughs> because the best was we got a lot of um, a lot of knowledge uh, on fire protection and uh, fire, fire behavior and fire protection systems and so on into the fire service um, which is very good and it became more of a like we actually have to look at what we're doing and test stuff but but we also became and are becoming more and more academic um, Everyone in senior command is basically a fire protection engineer, and it's a small country, so everybody knows everybody. So it's a small pond, and it kind of go like it's it's very hard to. Um, if if they think it looks good, now I'm, I'm, I'm you know you know, I'm t taking everyone over one broad, comb, broad mm -hmm. strokes, but but it's uh, if if it's very hard to to make sense that like it doesn't work in reality. Like I know that that, that sounds good on paper, really do, but in reality, you know, it, that, it's not gonna work. And and I've, I've been guilty of that myself for a lot because for a very long time, and I still think I have that problem, you look at what's the optimal solution, look at, I should make it this, but it's only optimal if you were to have like dedicated firefighters that, that train all the time, <laughs> yeah. but in reality, right. it's, yeah, I just have to make do with this. So, and right. that's I think that's a big problem we have uh, with with making theory go before practice, and it's well, that sweet yeah. harmony. There's also the fact that you you do have to make changes or policies for the average firefighter, not your yeah. superstars necessarily. You have to make changes that, uh, you know, they don't have to make sense to everyone uh, because we are in an organization where basically we are telling you what to do. And yeah. that's how it works. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that as long as what we're making you do works well for you and, you know, increases your safety and doesn't lower it. That's pretty good. But we also have to have firefighters that understand that, they work for the municipality and when the municipality uh, wants something done, you just have to work towards doing that and, and not always be in a protest mode. There's a lot, you know, <laughs> there's always people who think they have a better idea yet. They haven't spent five minutes on the problem. So well, uh, I, I'm, I'm one of those. I'm sorry. Yeah. I always have a better idea on everything. <laughs> No, it's okay to have a better idea. I think it's just you, you have to be able to. It's amazing how many people have better ideas that just sit there with them until another idea is brought out. Then suddenly you hear the better idea. Never hear it before, yeah. though. Um, but um, we had, I've had some things. Uh, the last year I've been involved in, I've basically been uh, tasked to rewrite our engine company procedures manual for yeah, the, cool. for the fire department. So. Yeah. It, been a long process we've uh we've done what i believe is a beautiful book uh we've changed a lot of things but we of course there's things you never change yeah. and um it's uh gonna be a, a much more uh reader friendly and uh much more to the point and also for us we're such a big organization and we have a lot of documents that we also have to make sure that our documents match yeah. uh in other areas so that's a big that's a lot to take on and nobody does that by themselves uh we had uh, help on the uh the uh, project as well and other officers and firefighters helped with it but in the end we want to uh streamline our operations and make it so that uh we explain maybe a little bit more of what on some things and also give our officers the ability to make decisions uh, everything can't be cut and dry. We have to leave room for the officer to make decisions on the fire ground, but we also have to present them with these choices, and we try and spell that out. So that that's an important tool for us is to have the officer and any firefighter, really. What we ultimately want is firefighters who understand the concept from the beginning on up, and it's okay to tell firefighters more information about stuff. 
um, glossing over stuff and saying, well, you know, to me, it's like um, I use NFPA 14 as a good example, which covers stamp pipes. Um, I think it's okay to talk about NFPA 14, not in great depth, but to give it to firefighters so that they are aware of why does this function this way? Where did this come from? Because a lot of firefighters basically, um, you know, aren't really going to seek out things. But if we present it to them initially, they have it. And then they can move from there. I think one of the, for me, I wasn't, when I started as firefighter, I wasn't you know, at all super interested in, in like firefighting. Mm-hmm. That was just, uh, you know, like, I thought it was fun. <laughs> like right. it was a fun part of the job. I, th- I, I, I so remember, and, and it, 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 and it's easier in hindsight, look at what was the, what was the real reason so what I got interested. I mean, first off, I'm, I'm a curious person. I'm like, I, I ask questions and I don't like answer it, you know, like, why is that? Well, because <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I want an answer. But the, most of the thing, I thought, I thought firefighting was easy. Like the first couple of years I, I, I spent on the job, I thought firefighting was easy. And that's, that was, that was the main reason I wasn't interested in, in firefighting. It wasn't until I understood, I started understanding that firefighting was hard <laughs> that I started finding it interesting. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the reason I found it, that I found it to be easy was because I've been sold absolute truths. This is how you do it, or this is why this happens and this, and you scratch on that and you, you look at behind it and there's always these simplifications that somebody made up. It, it might be a very good one, but it's some, somebody took a lot of information and made it simple or grasp, you know, it's possible to grasp. And when I started realizing that, firefighter became fun but because now it was more of a challenge. And I think that, uh, that I see it as a, one of my main problems right now is making, I mostly teach instructors, getting the instructors to really uh, drive home the point to the firefighters that we're teaching right, you right now are simplifications. And if you want to be an average, okay firefighter, you will do fairly good with these simplifications, these simple tricks and rules. But if you want to be a good firefighter, th- we're just scraping like the 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 the, the 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 surface here. So, and if somebody told me that earlier, that dude, you just if you know everything in this book, you are you're just average, <laughs> like mm-hmm. you're you're decent. Mm-hmm. And, the, mm-hmm. and the, the, the depth is so much more. If someone just told me that, I would have said at least five years of, of being really into the, to firefighting simply because of that. So having what you said, like making sure that firefighters have a, a simple foundation to stand on, I think that's crucial. They have simple guidelines. They have like, if, if nobody's thinking, at least they're not doing ex- something extremely stupid. <laughs> <laughs> like if they're just following the code, they're it, it, it's maybe that's the best incident, but at least not, it's not horrible. Right. But if someone if someone wants to think a little bit and you know dive into a book or two, there's room for improvement. Um, and as long as they understand that, I'm fairly happy with that. Um, I would I I agree with you in in a certain sense, but I'd also say this that. Uh, I, I've known many firefighters who were talented, who I would say were excellent firefighters, really, yeah. really good at what we asked them to do. And picking up a book was never in their, never in their wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, but they knew, they knew what was expected of them and, and had talents in the operational level. And yet uh, for interest in picking up a book, or a magazine or a trade magazine and reading that never came into their world, but yet were phenomenal uh, fire, fire ground firefighters. So I yeah, think but would they, I, I would bet that they were the same people that, that they scratched the surface and they had five different ways of raising the ladder instead of just the, the basic one. Well, yeah, no, I'm not saying that their, uh, their talents were, were narrow. No, I would agree that they, with thinking firefighters, but I think 
today, I, I would say this, today we see a lot of people who equate being good at the job by being into conferences and being into, uh, you know, like just more or stripping yeah. something down and getting into like the, the weeds of things. And that's fine. But that doesn't necessarily always translate to operational efficiency. That's the thing I'm uh, I'm I'm not against. The, I, I love hearing people being into the fire service. I love it. Uh, but some people are are um, getting into the weeds on things that you don't need the weeds for. But <laughs> well, and, someone has to because otherwise you don't need if you need you, you don't know if you need it or not. You wouldn't have any weeds. But, <laughs> but I, what I'm what I. I'm just trying to, let's see, I, I might, can I say this? Uh, it's just, um, I think the internet has a lot to do with it, obviously, yeah. because you would have never known what other people were doing anywhere no. years ago. So I just think that we have an internet firefighter and there's a lot of that. And I see it a lot because I'm, I'm heavily involved with the social media and stuff. Yeah. But um, I see that we are tending to judge people by, um, their content that they put out and things like that. And yet I have no idea what kind of a firefighter these people are. And, and it doesn't affect me because I don't work with them, but it's just, uh, I'm, I mean, I knew plenty of firefighters that were phenomenal and never had to like go around and, you know, prove it every day. It's just kind of a weird dynamic going on in the world today. Well, I think, you know, let me, let me, if I, if I say what you're trying to say, which I agree with, uh, but I don't necessarily see it as, let's say this, if I look at myself, when I became an officer, um, I tried to, of course, become a better officer. And it took a long time for me to kind of, I mean, you have to define like the problem. Why am I not as good as I want to be and so on? What do I need to improve? And it took a long time for me to, to address that. Well, there's one thing to make a plan for how you should, you know, this fire ground should be controlled or how you op to attack the fire, what tactics and strategies and so on. And the other, if you take a core skill is to make it happen, which is all about command and leadership and so on. And when I started defining my problems in those two areas, but much easier because I'm a much better plan maker. Mm -hmm. I'm a much better at, you know, the book smarts, if you want to go that. I'm much better at making a plan, thinking out and analytical, and assessing the problem, making a plan, than I am of being operationally a good fire command officer. Because being operationally a good fire command officer, you have to spend a lot of time on the fire ground or mm -hmm. in very good training, which is, you know, it's very hard to do. In making, you know, leadership, assessing situation, dealing with one to one, make doing proper orders that make sense <laughs> mm -hmm. that people actually follow, which is a whole different skill set. So right. with that said, it, I, I totally agree with you. You you can have again the personality to me, if, if I'm if I'm leaning towards somewhere else, I'm leaning towards Book Smart, I'll lean towards an internet fire dragon slayer. <laughs> because like that's just most of my brain works. Uh, I, I like th think very with brain with, with problems in my head. Um, but without useless skills and ties into what we talked about before, the thing that you have to, if you know what something is dangerous, do you know that a mattress is dangerous if lifted up? You know everything about the mattress, what it's made of and what the gases are and everything. That doesn't necessarily tell you anything about what to do in, when you have that problem in your hand or have the skills to actually wield the host line or whatever it might be. So there is this, and, and Sweden has gone from, Sweden went from and still are in that process of going from being being a, a profession for workers, no emphasis on books. It was, if you go back 30 years, well, you look like a boxer. Hey, come join the fire service. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was literally that. My when I started, my chiefs were like, yeah, they were all like wrestlers and and yeah. professional hockey yeah. players and everything. It was it was just that. Right. And, right. And then you had the switch where fire protection engineers got in, and, and now there's it's it's a two year program. You have to have good grades to get into fire program. So the needle switched over here, and I don't know if it switched too far, but it's definitely borderline too far, or if it if it's not gone too far already. Because 
we are losing a lot of the practical application or the willingness to be good with tools and trades and so on. So in, yeah. in, if you simplify it, we are getting much, much better at making good plans, but we have nobody to execute them. <laughs> Maybe if you want to describe it like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I totally agree with you that that is a problem. And now, for instance, if you're a part time firefighter in Sweden, you, 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 you typically have a, a, a normal job, a real job mm -hmm. <laughs> on the side. Mm -hmm. You're a carpenter or for that matter, a financial advisor or whatever. And then you go on call with your fire truck. And as a part time firefighter now, I worked full time before, but now a part timer, um, I work with those kind of people. And they right. have real jobs. They're carpenters and they're electricians. And when you go out on a call, you have all those skills with you. And they're, mm -hmm. that's their skills, but they also bring the generic sense of understanding what a building is. Sure. Our full-time firefighters, they're typically today, they're straight from school. They go into a two-year program when they become a, fire, uh, a firefighter. But they have no... So a lot of people have that anyway because they're interested, but a lot, some of them, or even a lot of them, to your program, they have no interest or experience doing anything practically. So if mm -hmm. you if you if you come into and say, okay, this is a house, they understand that, but how the house is built, like bzz, what's behind the walls, I have no idea. Right. So you you have uh, thirty years. That wasn't the problem. Everybody sort of built their own houses in the fire service and they help each other build houses. Mm -hmm. you, you, you got a lot for free. Right, right. Well, you, our, our, our model has, our fire service has changed in that regard as well. Um, we have a lot of firefighters who either through age or uh, choice of occupation did not go into trades. Uh, prior to joining the fire service and don't really have um, the level of knowledge of a carpenter or an electrician as to how a, a building is put together. But I didn't have it either. And um, when I came on, I came basically a year and a half out of college yeah. and uh, I joined the fire department. But yeah. I don't think that is something we can't overcome. To me, I want to build the skill of firefighter. Uh, if you're an electrician, that's wonderful, but you're here to learn how to be a firefighter, and that's what we have to teach you in our uh, books and things. We need to obviously include building construction so yeah. that people can get a leg up on their lack of knowledge. But other than that, I don't think we have to have people that are in the trades. I never thought that. That's just my own personal opinion. I I think if our job is to make you a firefighter, no matter where you came what whatever your background was and i and i well i would say I'm, if i were to have an opinion on this that was more of a remark if i had an opinion of I, if i were to design my perfect fire service i would like to have a mix like i would have like to have a mix like i would oh, like to have some carpenters i would like to have some people that understand a building because even if you do it we don't have the training hours to make people who generically are not interested in building construction understand building construction I, I, they, they, you can you can show them a million powerpoints. They're still not going to look like what, what's this? This is a board. Yes, it's a board, but you know, like there's a lot of different kinds of boards, and they're yeah. used in different places. And it's fairly good to know that. Um, so it's it's very hard to do that. So having a mix would be would be awesome. Uh, now, I don't know. There's so many factors that go into that, like politics and budgets. Well, I mean, and, we also and, have to revert to that. We have. We have firefighters that come on that went to uh, great colleges in yeah. the States and have advanced degrees. And somebody could turn around saying, what are you doing here? What, what, what are you doing here? This is this is what they call a blue collar profession, <laughs> not a white collar profession. And yet we have them there. And, uh, you know, what one thing for them and one of the things I've seen in recent years with the younger firefighters that were getting on is their ability to. Uh, study very well. They have an ability to absorb. Uh, we have a tremendous volume of uh, information, yeah. and they their study habits and the use of uh, you know iPads and and um, how to break things down is uh, much more advanced than it was years ago. So we're seeing a lot of people who do very well on our exams, and um, 
they have a higher level of education, most of them. And, uh, you know, it's just a different group. It was more of a, a high school. Uh, I mean, I don't have any numbers on it, no. but I would say we have a lot more college educated people than we ever did. Do you think, do you think, I know this is a hard question to ask, but taking aside that, of course, as a fire service, we know more about, for instance, firefighting. We know more about fire behavior and for just the UL studies and so on. Uh, but taking that aside, do you think that the fire service uh, produces better firefighters today than it did 30 years ago when you, when you joined? I would hope so. <laughs> you well, know, I'm, 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 I, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, you I, I know, think I, so too here, but I'm not I'm super open. confident. Uh, I think we just have a range. Like you said before, we have people who have uh, minimal interest. We have people who have uh, dedicated interest and we have, you know, we, ha it's like any, it's like yeah. any occupation. Yeah. There's going to be any, any team, even there's going to be outstanding players and there's going to be average players. And then there's a few that, you know, are just along for the ride. It, it's just the way it is. Well, I would and say, I, I would say, you it's, realize that you're better off you are. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, sometimes I, you know, like we have this discussion, we, we, we'll get into because I want to talk to you about risk is going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But, but uh, like, like, how do you define risk and what is risk and what is acceptable risk and so on. But, but before that, um, we had, we had this discussion sometimes, oh, sorry, it's, there's a light here I need to fix. I'll be back. Okay. What's up, Law? I'm still doing this with him. He's just fixing a light or something that went out. He's from Sweden. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so where was I? Yeah, well, well, we talked about... No, where was I? We talked about... We were just talking about the makeup of today's fire service, the yes, college. Yes, but, but why? The college graduates, blah, blah, blah. Uh, damn it, because there was something I wanted your opinion on. Mm. Give me, give me, give me a couple more. Oh, damn it, it slipped my mind. Uh, it, it was some it was something about not risk but tied to that we're gonna, I thought it was gonna tie it nicely into the to discuss mm -hmm. the risk later because um, because in in, in in Sweden um, I would say we are maybe maybe we're creating better firefighters I don't know um, the, the, the I think if you were to join if you were to have today's firefighters with merge with with the firefighters then, as a as a mix, I think that would be the best. Like the combination of, it, it would painting broad stru structures more more of a trades person, and now getting into more. It, the government wants it to be more academic. Like that's why they built the two year program. It should be more study. It should be more, should be more of a, of a not a blue collar job. A, a, sort of white collar job, but in the end, it still is a blue collar job. So it's this hybrid of, they can't call it a university degree because there's too much hands on. Mm -hmm. So it's a post college degree. Nice. Like it's, there's too much practical elements in the course, even though they've tried to make it as theoretical as possible. <laughs> well, um, I, think if you, I think if you took firefighters from 30 years ago and were able to do a little time travel, and put them in firehouses of today, it'd be, it'd be a lot of it would be the same, but a lot of it would be different. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we definitely have changed a lot over the years. And um, a lot of that is, is brought on by the times the fire, the fire service at times is sort of like a cloistered uh, place to work. Uh, you know, we, we have our own rules and we have our own ways. And yet uh, some of those remain and some have been changed, you know, by decree, if you will. 
you know. So, so that ties in like I was I don't remember exactly it was something with culture because when I started here by New York mm-hmm. uh, by firefighters New York I mean that was when I when I started getting interested in fire service outside of Sweden I did I before that I didn't even know there was firefighters outside of Sweden <laughs> well technically yes but you know like yeah. you have no idea what are the fire service are doing around the world right, right, um, right. because every fire service in the world is the best right <laughs> There's, well, there's no fire service in the world goes yeah. like we're, we're, we're like average, like every right. fire service in the world is like we're the best. Yeah. Why should we learn about anything else right. when we're Correct. doing it perfectly? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, always- but anyway, but then I was, one of the things that that I, I learned from, for instance, America was the, this, the, the the discussion was starting then in Sweden about cancer, for instance. Mm-hmm. like how to f- prevent cancer and the use of SCBA. And, and in Sweden, it was basically, the, I think all countries had like stained equipment, smelling like soot and, you know, soot in your face, a burnt up helmet. That was that was a badge of honor. Like mm-hmm. that, that I've never been anywhere in the world that that hasn't been a badge of honor. Um, right. Right. Uh, and that was the same for Sweden. So like if you... 15 years ago, maybe at least 20 years ago, we went in the firehouse, it should smell like smoke. You would, you would smell that three days after it was a fire. Right. And, and again, there was a, there was a badge of honor. And then the, the culture of uh, the cancer came about. And one thing that struck me when I, when I asked around around the world was in Sweden, uh, when people start realizing that smoke was bad and so on, it took, it took a long time to get rid of the badge of honor. Like, like, Washing your helmet after a fire, I think that that took a long time. Or, but but to get people to wear an SCBA like more frequently, like when mm-hmm. if you're out in the hallway, there's a fire in an apartment. Um, a lot of departments and some some still do um, aren't very keen on it. But like we have a door person. We always had mm-hmm. two two firefighters inside, one at the door. That's okay. been going on. F- Sweden took the regulation for smoke diving from water diving. Okay. Like one of the earliest. So, so water diving had two divers and a, and a line operator. So people okay. go, the authorities was like, well, just, just use that, but just replace the, Now it's smoke diving. Mm-hmm. So that's why we had a line operator. Now it's the, it's the doorman. So we have always had a doorman. The doorman was the ch- in charge of the two firefighters inside. So it was sort of a, a like a semi officer. Okay. But anyway, so this guy usually didn't have a, a CBA on, you, you know, like it, it was smoke coming out of the that, but they, they didn't use a mask because they wanted to be able to, to communicate, communicate and so mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. And in that process, for instance, the doorman started using SCBA more because now it wasn't just because um, uh, if you need it or not short term, you, you, you wanted it for learn, long term use. And then I started understand uh, reading about New York and you hear this crazy stories about you know like you know cheaters uh, and, and those kind of things and, and I started hearing the concepts about uh, the, the derogatory terms of yard breeders and you know like all the, the things that goes you shouldn't use air because you might need it later that was now conflicting with well breeding smoke in the hallway or breeding smoke when the winds pushing it out in the grass that's not good for you either. So uh, what I wanted is that if you go back and, and look at New York 20 years ago, and you look at 10 years and 10 year, uh, year ago, just the culture around, um, to make it simple, wearing breathing apparatus around smoke. How has that changed and how does it look like now? Well, um, getting back to, let's go back a little bit further. Yeah. Let's talk about... Um, just the apparatus, the diesel fumes from the apparatus, when they would start up, they would be, I mean, just be a, a whole plume of black <laughs> smoke. Yeah. And basically years ago, years ago, uh, it was just part of the firehouse. You yeah. know, it wasn't, our kitchen was in the back, our, our living accommodations were upstairs. There was, you know, some doors upstairs on the pole holes, but, yeah. you know, nothing to seal it out, so to speak. And then eventually uh, through... Uh, I remember one of the fellows in the union, at least, was very much into it. They ended up getting, uh, you know, hoses hooked up to the exhaust pipes and, you know, extract that uh, 
till they leave the fire house and then when the fire when the fire truck uh, backed in they would attach this hose again for that portion of the ride back into the firehouse to capture the diesel yeah. exhaust so i would say that was one of the first things we did as a department to um protect members health yeah. but it's a it's been a long time since then now we've always had an scba policy where um if you're in an idlh you're supposed to be wearing your mask yeah. Uh, How do you define that's always IDLH? Been... Is well, there like a policy? Like you said, if you were outside, if you were outside the building and uh, a breeze of smoke passed you by, more than likely you just dealt with it. So it wasn't like people out. I would say if you were in smoke constantly, you would have your mask on. But of course, there was always times when there were times when people felt they didn't need it. Yeah. You know, that could breathe just fine, and they didn't need that as as a crutch or assistance so they wouldn't use it so and again so it was I, it was based on short time exposure yeah, meaning meaning yeah, yeah, there's, there's yeah. always that yeah, of course but um when i came on the scba was available we we used it um but mass compliance as we might refer to in new york mass compliance was never a hundred percent it's probably never a hundred percent anywhere at least in the States, at least yeah. that I'm aware of, but that doesn't mean that's a good thing. Uh, we definitely now seem to finally, the light bulb is going off about the fact that this is long-term exposure. Um, you know, you'd go to a place, let's say, and uh, they were burning the food on the stove. And while it's nasty, it's something you can go through. And yeah. in five, 10 minutes, it's all gone basically. But, but basically, what's the cumulative effect of doing that over and over? And, you know, maybe just one more is all you needed. And next thing you know, years down the road, you're, you're sick. So um, the move to protect firefighters, maybe from themselves, is uh, something that has to be done. And a lot of times, it won't necessarily grow organically. Sometimes it has to be forced upon people um, to break that um, the current uh, usage or non-usage of whatever it might be. In other words, uh, you know, if we want people to wear their uh, air longer, then we need people to enforce that and to make people do it and also to allow people to not save it necessarily. Yeah. In other words, they're saving it. What are you saving it for? We'll bring somebody else in here and you can go out if you want to get Another bottle, fine, but, um, you know, don't save it. There's no good reason to save it, basically. Just use it. Um, but, you know, that comes from leadership. You know, uh, you repeat what you see often. Yeah. Firefighters repeat what they see. And uh, so from top down, that has to be a priority, I would say. So but because and, I, you, you but I think you're getting better at it. I think you, you touched on it, but I want to clarify it. Because in Sweden, it was... From my perspective, and how we would describe it, was it, it was it was primarily a, a lazy reason not to wear your SCBA. You didn't want to clean it, or maybe you didn't want it putting it on. You just go like, well, I'll, I'll just stand here, I'll walk a bit aside, or or I'll just I just dip out and kept catch your breaths and so on. It was it was sort of laziness not to wear it was one part because we didn't have it was it wasn't before it wasn't after just any culturally it like. You're not a man enough to eat smoke, for instance. Like mm -hmm. you, you're, you should. Die. So we didn't have to fight that culture. Now, if you were to define in New York, how much is it due to um, the culture of well, you should, you should eat, you should eat smoke, and how much is it towards you should, for instance, like you said, save it for for when you really need it, and how much is just pure laziness or, or you know, like I don't, I don't really care. About the well, I, I would say today, because most firefighters, I would say the vast, I, I, you can never say all, but yeah. I would say the vast majority of firefighters. First of all, if you don't have it when you come off the apparatus to go into a, at a working fire, then you're not going to be able to produce as much as the person next to you. If you're both equal, they're going to be able to do a lot better job than you. And so now you're limiting yourself, you're limiting your working capability, you're limiting your rescue capability. So right off the bat, you can't allow firefighters to do that. That can't be entertained at all. 
And then, you know, the other factor is that we want the firefighters to wear it. And I would say today, because of the toxicity, the smoke and and uh, what they're dealing with that's burning today, all the chemicals, firefighters today are, are much more into uh, protecting themselves than they were 30 years ago. That's for that's for Don Shaw. Yeah. I would say that's for sure. And the smoke is such that you can't take it. So it's like, well, you know, what are you trying to prove? There's nothing to prove. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work anymore. No, I usually no. say, well, I could go out a couple seconds more, baby. But, you know, it's still yeah. dedication yeah. to the job. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, like you said, I mean, for the, the vast, it's just looking at, I mean, when I look at, it's the problem we have, still have today with training. If you put a couple pallets in, in a corner, unless you have a tight building, it's very hard to get a ventilation control. If you don't get a ventilation control, you don't get a lot of smoke. You just get fire and good mm -hmm. visibility, uh, mm -hmm. which is very similar to where, you know, you all say grandpa's fire in the 50s with, you know, just natural materials. And and if you go to real fires today, at least develop fires, we're not talking the small fire on the stove, you have basically smoke to the floor. Mm -hmm. Like you, 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 there's, you can't get away from the smoke by crawling or going spaces. There's like this smoke everywhere. Yeah. And sure, you could theoretically hold your breath and take deep breaths wherever you find it in cracks and maybe go up deep, but we go like, it's, it's, it's hard, but I still hear stories. I don't know if there's true or not, but you still hear, you know, people finding cheaters in New York and so on. But I don't know if that's uh, I, just I, urban I legends. That, yeah, that kind of went. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I've been around a long time. I I had one years ago myself. Um, yeah. But they, I haven't seen one in decades. To be no, honest no, with maybe, you. That, it's, it, but, even if they no. are, you can't talk about it because it's against their department policy. No, but yeah, it, yeah. I, I just find it interesting as a part of the of the culture that what is a problem in culture in one country may not be in another country. Um, True. True. I mean, we have other culture problems that I don't know that you don't have to deal with, which I find highly, highly <laughs> annoying. Mm -hmm. uh, but just for an example, just wearing wearing a breathing apparatus, because again, in the internet, you you would hear, you would le read YouTube comments, and you would always find those derogatory terms of why is this person on air on when they're sitting by the door and there's not a lot of smoke. Right, right. Uh, because you're like you're just wasting air. You're you're, you're just a yard breather. You know, go home to mommy, <clears throat> and these things. And, and I go like, well, well, it can go from zero smoke to a lot of smoke in two seconds. That's right. that's just how full paths work. And if you're not on air, you're not ready to do something about it. You would you would right. still you put your mask on. And even if that's not the case, maybe that guy wants to go home to his family for the next thirty years without cancer. Or girl. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say argument. that. I wouldn't say that's uh, going on anymore. I would say that most firefighters are wearing are are, are wearing their SCBA. The only uh, uh, misstep we may have is taking it off prematurely. That that yeah. would probably be something maybe we could work on. But um, as for actual during the heat of battle, yeah, I would say we're at a hundred percent compliance. But you know. Uh, Again, no, there's, so, there's, always, you know, yeah. there's a well, lot of things going on. Yeah. One thing that started, we had, we were also taking our packs out too soon. And I think one of the, one of our uh, realizations was when we started starting carrying CO monitors on, on, on overhaul more. Because when we started wearing C, CO monitors, carbon monoxide, mm -hmm. uh, right. um, they were, they were, you know, beeping, showing dangerous levels when there was zero smoke right sure yeah. you have you have uh, smoldering fires in the walls you smoldering fires underwear so they're producing no visible smoke but still a lot of carbon monoxide cool. and and people go like yeah i don't want to be carbon monoxide poisoned you know like i don't want to yeah. have a headache i'll just wear yeah. a, wear a breathing apparatus um because yeah. that tied into of course just because i can't see smoke doesn't mean it's dangerous um so that that helped really to to get people to wear it, um, but that well, ties into the, the concept of risk. Oh, sorry. You know, I, I was a company officer for twenty five years or more, a little bit more, and um, you know sometimes you just have to 
be the boss and decide for somebody that this is what we're going to do. We're going to wear our SCBA and they might look at you like, really? Yeah, we're going to do it. And, you know, maybe, maybe it isn't obvious or maybe it pans out to be nothing, but the, the job is to take care of them. So uh, sometimes the job we're at isn't that crazy. And the emphasis is really placed more on the protection of the personnel yes. and other times it's more the protection is placed more on the people than than the firefighters i mean you, you know you might you might say i mean i want to take this when we get into risk also but you might say that most 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 fires we go to and most incidents we go to um there's no potential for us for a save or a rescue or something i mean most fire fires are easy or small or trivial um and if you, in long-term side, if you protect yourself on the small ones, in, in significant ones, uh, you can take a couple of really bad breaths <laughs> at, at, at when it really matters. <laughs> and it won't make a difference in the long run either. So, so it makes a lot of sense to protect yourself well, long-term wise, just on trivial things also. Because again, it's the it's accumulated effect that will that will that will get you in the end. Well, it could be just the the, the one effect. Could oh get yeah, you. it could be definitely the one. Now, yeah. because I, I find risk one, and I want to start off because one of the examples there was a video. I don't know exactly where it was. I got a video a couple of maybe it's a year ago, two years. I don't even remember anymore. There was a New York battalion chief who was screaming on the radio for firefighters up on some high-rise building like get your fucking ass in there you'd go get it the fire and so on he was just screaming like get in there you know you you i don't understand what the problem is now i don't know much about that incident so i don't want to talk about that incident just as a just as a as a a way of starting discussion because that type of, of incident would never have happened in sweden it would never ever ever happen in sweden that you would have an incident commander saying something like that, or even remotely close to that. And, and to start off, before I get to my question, I want to start with is in Sweden, as I understand it, uh, sorry, in Sweden, um, you are employed in the fire service. You're not sworn in. Uh, get to that. You're employed by the fire service, and there's a there's a workers' regulation guide that says you can't be harmed at your job. It's not specific to the fire service, but it's, it's, you know, it's a generic one to all jobs. So it's the responsibility of every employer to make sure that the employees are not harmed. It doesn't matter if you work in the fire service or police and so on. So there's no special regulation for firefighters. There's no special for the police. There's no special for the, for the army, I, I would say. I mean, I think that they have the same one. It's just that if there's a war, you know, the different rules start to apply. And then... On top of that, there's there's this law that says that every fire every employee is their own. What do you call it? The safety chief. <laughs> I don't know, safe, safety. Mm -hmm. There, every employee has the right to say no. I don't want to do that. I find it to be dangerous. Like, as an officer, if it were the case, as a fire officer, I say I want you two firefighters to go in there and fight that fire, and they say no. There's nothing I can do. Like if they decide that doesn't feel safe, they don't have to. It's part mm -hmm. again. It's not nothing specific to the fire service. It's just specific to all. Uh, in reality, I don't know if there's much difference on, on an American fire ground and a Swedish one and so on. But if you take it just on paper, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Swede the American fire service is sworn in, meaning you you take an oath and you. You uphold the, the the serve the citizens and protect the citizens, and so on. And you and you basically swear an oath that I will t I will I will I will risk something at least, if not everything, to put you know save property and lives and so on. And how that plays out in reality, I know, is there's a vast difference between where you are in America and different individuals. But for me, it is a very interesting difference because when you're employed and you are supposed to be guaranteed protection, uh, the, the, the foundation is you should not be harmed at your job. It is just a job, which is a drastically different approach than saying sworn in and I will go in and I will 
potentially harm myself doing good for others, which is a much more on the paper, much more noble and much more, I would say, heroic in that sense, way of the foundation for how you operate as a fire service. Do you think that way that it's oath driven, that it's that it's you are you are you are uh, you are uh, serving, you're not employed is part of the reason uh, American Fire Service maybe depending how you look at it tolerate a high risk on the job or willingness to take a risk that's a separate question if that's true but do you mm. think it do you think it's do you think it matters well um, it may matter in contrast to what you're saying about uh, you know that you won't have any harm come to you in this occupation. We don't, we don't sign papers saying that. And we don't, uh, to us, uh, I would think that's a little naive that, you know, you would sign a piece of paper that, uh, basically says, you know, uh, I'm not going to get injured doing this job. Nobody, nobody wants to get injured, obviously, but, um, uh, there could be something to that. I, I would, I would say that's possible, but I just think that the American Fire Service, because you're swearing in is only a minute or two. Uh, I can't remember the exact thing I was sworn in, you know, under what words exactly. No. But I would say that there is a sense of duty that that uh, pushes our people forward. Maybe when things are uncomfortable, um, certainly you want to work with the people you're working with. It, it's very organic. Uh, uh, you know, the fire service is small teams for the most part. Uh, even in New York City, an engine company is only four or five people and, and an officer. And, um, you know, they work as a unit together under a mission to try and put the fire out. Sometimes that mission is is easy. It's super easy. Sometimes it's very difficult. And I think that... that um, the oath is forgotten. It's long forgotten. And it's more about um, being with these people that you're with that depend on you to do your job or at least give it a good shot. And then there is the uh, the people that depend on us to do that, um, the people who own the home and uh, whose lives might be at stake. Uh, a lot of times when we go to fires, uh, there are people whose lives are endangered at the, at that time, especially at night and things like that. So while the oath is interesting and uh, it's the starting point, I think when you get down to it, it's more about, you know, the individual uh, fire and uh, doing a good job, um, having the accolades of your peers and uh, being a responsible um responsible and committed to the effort do you think the oath is just uh is the, is the oath is just a symptom of of the way of looking at the job as a duty meaning that was you swear an oath because you think the work the job is a duty rather than you swear an oath and that therefore the job is a duty <laughs> well i think rather no, than I'm, just a job yeah. I mean, the oath has been around a long time, obviously. I think maybe they they wanted an oath because they realized that this is dangerous work. Yeah. Uh, even back, you know, 100 years or whenever it was, that most people <laughs> want to run from this thing. <laughs> so the people that we got to sign up, you know what? We're going to thank them in a way. We're going to give them this oath, and we're going to say, we're going to freely admit to them that this is dangerous work. And that by you swearing to do this uh, makes you a little different from everybody else. Do you, that's the positive way of saying it. Do you think it? Do you think there's possibility of a negative way also? It was just a you know get you know uh, get out of jail free card for for people in charge to say that well you said it was dangerous and something bad happened you know, like you swore an oath like we, we're not to blame here. No, I think I I don't think. Um... If we go way back, I, I, I think, you know, risk and, and injury was uh, injury was very common in all fields. Uh, yeah. Obviously, if you look back to 
the early 1900s, building buildings, construction workers were falling to their deaths, lots of accidents there. In every industry, there was a lot of accidents. And then as time progressed, uh, other entities came about that said, wait a minute, we OSHA, we have to have some safety features in here. And, and, And then also the organizations themselves looked at what they were doing and said, you know, can we rewrite this? Can we think about not going headlong into this thing that's going to get people hurt um you know building collapse all these things we had to learn we learned a lot the hard way but we learned that you know under certain circumstances it's probably best that we not do what they did 20 years ago so yeah. i think i think it's a bit of progression as well uh it probably started off very much like who cares? Lives are cheap. I mean, if you look at yeah. you look at the lives of firefighters in the New York City Fire Department when it first started, they worked like every day of the month except for like one day they were off. So these were not people that yeah. were extremely highly regarded. Let's put it that way, you know. So, but I, I mean, the the problem right. with the problem is like you said, you know, like it's a prog- progression towards something. Um, safer and, and we can get into discussion about safer if that is a, on the on the cost of being efficient or effective but it, it, you always struggle with the thing like you know stupid John it did something stupid uh, now nobody gets to do it like you had that I mean that's the that's the I mean the most common the common reason for rules being made or guidelines or everything is somebody does something and majority of people would never do that because they've had better training or they were just not as stupid as Johnny. Uh, so you have this this problem that, that a lot of rules, um, you put protection against this and this on the factory or in the fire service, you say you can't do this. So you have to have a harness doing this. Um, a lot of those you may arguably say, of course, are good, saying that, well, the cost of, 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 of implementing this safety feature, if the feature is, for instance, more training, or if the train, or if it is, uh, you know, better equipment, or safer equipment, and so on, that's just good. You know, like if we, you know, if the hose are bursting, get better hose. Like that's just good. I mean, that's awesome. But then you have those, like, to 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 take an example, the the famous uh, in America, the guy who went in and carried out the old lady from the house and he did it before the the two in two out this buddy was was operation and he was he was uh he was uh disciplined you know the, you know the case of it. Yeah, oh yes yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes so i'm yes. i'm not super i mean it's just find it interesting so like see so if take that example so we we have a firefighter who does something on a personal level of course very commendable i have no idea if it was risky or not i mean that's you know let's let's just assume that 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 guy knew what he was doing and he decided that this is this is not a problem obviously it wasn't a problem because he came out and he had the 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 lady with him and so on so he did something on a personal level really good and obviously it was beyond what his gear can capable of and what he was capable of but he did something now someone has decided against uh, an sop now that's just an example. So let's not dig into that one because I don't know exactly about that, and there's a huge debate about that. But the the, the problem is, of course, interesting. Like, because in my head, I would like to have it like this, but I'm not sure it actually works. So in Sweden, again, it's it's viewed as a job. If you if you and this is not viewed as a job, but on paper, it's a job. You're employed. The employer should make sure you're safe and so on. Mm-hmm. But but we always we don't we don't look at that as I would look at it as a minimum. Like if I sign on a job and it says, okay, I'm just going to put my f- shoes in. I'm just going to do the minimum. I'm I'm not going to be extraordinary. On the opposite, I'm going to be just barely good enough that I can stay in this organization. Um, what is required of me of my employer employer says you have to wear this safety equipment you get this training you can't do x y and z because it's too dangerous and when you go home hopefully you're safe you're you're not going to get injured but if me if i'm a badass fire hero dragon slayer macho rambo 
if you want to take some extra risk because you feel that you can handle it, go ahead. If you want to carry out this old lady on your back, um, go ahead. Now the problem, of course, that I mean, I would love that um, that the employer guarantees a minimum amount of safety. But if you want to, if you want to go below that, it's up to you. But then, of course, this puts in a perspective of you're not alone. You're working with a team. You're working with a group. And if you put yourself in danger, you put other people potentially in danger. So how do you have a system where, where you allow people to take what they perceive an acceptable risk, which is hard to quantify or you know, acceptable risk on a personal level, uh, but you still don't endanger any, any one of your teammates or colleagues who might disagree with your choice on what an acceptable risk is. And an organization which has some kind of obligation for your safety, because that's true for the United States too. They have an obligation for you to be, at least try to, for you firefighters to be safe, if not guaranteed. Is that a complicated question? Well, it's uh, got a few layers to it. I would... <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> but you can you can start at it in any way you yeah. like. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's look at it um, just a single firefighter. Yeah. Uh, operating solo makes a decision to do something. Now, it could be, you know, fairly benign. In other words, uh, they've cut open a roof and somebody borrowed the tool to push down the ceiling and they grab a piece of wood and they get closer to the hole and use the shorter pieces of wood to push down the ceiling. And all of a sudden the fire comes out at them. Whereas maybe if they had that distance with a, a longer hook, that wouldn't have been such a big deal. Yeah. So each firefighter, you know, uh, decides on what they're going to do, uh, operating by themselves, let's say. And that thought process might be good, until something bad happens or it was bad to begin with and they just didn't see it. There's that as well. Uh, you know, their situational awareness is not very high on what they're going to do next. And next thing you know, there's an injury now or a close call. Um, so that's something we have to look at now, whether it's noticed or not, who knows the firefighter could have done this and nobody saw what happened and they don't report it to uh, educate anyone else they just they just take it on the chin and and that's that so let's, we let's don't say, learn let's, let's say that you in new york or you could take america as a generic one if mm -hmm. that is the case and they do get injured or somebody noticed them so the, the the organization knows that they did they they jumped the hoops somewhere they they mm -hmm. they did something without a pike pole and so on and they burnt their hands for instance um what 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 could be the consequences of that and what should be the consequences? Should it be none? Uh, well, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Um, about consequences tend to sound like there's going to be some negative uh, consequences. Well, it doesn't have to. Yeah. What's, what would the outcome be? What's your step? Uh, the outcome would be, um, for us, a especially a burn injury, would be a report of the circumstances of how it occurred and then analyze that. The officer would analyze that and... Uh, it would be reported up the chain, and then we'd also have to write in a written report as to what could have prevented it, anything yeah. that could have prevented it. So basically, you know, if that was the case, let's just say the example was the case, yeah. uh, you'd probably say, you know what, the firefighter should have waited till uh, someone else showed up with the tool that was available to give them the distance uh, to not get injured. So, uh, Do you like you know, that? If yeah. you were to design the system, do you, do you, would you like that to be the system? Uh, I don't have a problem with that being the system. If somebody wants to further um, investigate that, that is, uh, you know, built into the system as well. Um, injuries on the fire ground should be examined and probably um, should be uh, kicked up to the next level to get not to be interrogated necessarily, but to get more of the specifics of what happened and and what could we do to prevent that and get that good knowledge out there. Now, we have all of that in place in the FDNY. Yeah. We have um, sheets that go out about 
close calls that happen to firefighters. We also have a uh, sort of an anonymous close call that you can write about and people can read about and uh, what you learn from it. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of knowledge going out there with that. But, you know, people take chances on doing things that they thought was they thought something was a good way to do it. And sometimes it doesn't work out that way. So um, unless it's really beyond the pale, in other words, really, really like 99 out of 100 people wouldn't have done this. This (laughs) is really stupid. Uh, I think a lot of it is just well intentioned and, you know, it it certainly doesn't require a slap on the wrist. But, you know, when we have people operating dangerously, uh, that's a problem. So, again, that person could be operating individually and, and it's not that big of a deal until something happens to them and maybe they get seriously hurt. Then the investigation is what happened. But when you're operating with other people, there's a bit of a check and balance, hopefully, uh, between you and that other firefighter or a couple of the firefighters that, you know, maybe you're going to announce that, hey, you know what, I think we can get in there. And meanwhile, the fire is blowing out down the hallway. And I think we can get in there. And that's what the company officer is there for, to make sure that, you know, uh, ideas like, you know, that could turn into really bad situations are not carried on. You know, everybody's idea of uh, risk on the fire ground is different. If they're, they might both be in sync with the idea or one is in conflict with the other. But, uh, you know, hopefully most of our firefighters have a good sense of uh, what they can do. One of the biggest things I always try and emphasize is it's one thing to try and make the rescue. Basically, we're talking about a rescue yeah. or I'll give it to that. Um If you're going to try and make a rescue, that's one thing. Getting in there is one thing. The other thing is getting them. That's another thing. But the other biggest thing is getting out. Yeah. So uh, a lot of firefighters only see half of that equation, getting in and uh, getting the person and not seeing the exit part. And that that's important. Same. It's no different with uh, often talk about in stamp pipes uh, coming up the stairway closest to the fire, if you possibly can. Because you don't want to follow a hose line out and pass an exit that's close to to to, uh, to safety. So again, it doesn't come into play all the time. But um, you know, risk is different for everyone. But um, we have to try and figure out what the parameters are, uh, and that's hard to that's hard to lay out for every little circumstance that that comes up. Um, I would say if it looks bad to most people, it's probably a bad idea. Um, Could you get away with it? Yeah, maybe you could. But getting away with something is not a good idea either because you can get away with something 99 times and then that 100th time you don't get away with it and it builds this false sense of, uh, you know what, this is a good way to do something. So that's another thing the fire service has to be careful of falling into that trap. Uh, Well, we've been successful with this so many times so what's the problem and then all of a sudden the problem shows itself and you know so i think the fire service is uh you know uh tactically has to think about things where you know i always say if it's a loser don't worry about calling it a loser if you've decided that something is a losing prospect for us as to getting in this building then you know what just leave it at that it's very dangerous to change your mind on something like that. If you've declared it a loser, it's a loser. We'll come back and fight one that we can win. But every once in a while, uh, you'll come across something where it's best to just, pack, you know, take it easy, do what we can, and come back for another day. Because uh, that's really what it's all about. Um, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You have to, you know, spread yourself yeah. out. It's a long career. You, you're going to take some wins, you're going to take some losses, and you can't take it personally. It is what it is. Uh, you know, we do the best we can. That's all you can ever do is do the best you can. And I think I think that's uh, another motivator for firefighters is that um, some of them have a higher level of what they feel that they can do and what their 100% is compared to somebody else who's like we talked about before, basically is just there. So what is their 100% contribution? Well, it's probably not that. It's probably a 70 compared to the other person. So 
that person is going to perform at a higher level and you have to try and know what's going on in their heads. If you can, if you have the opportunity to work with them, um, that's why that unit unit cohesion is so nice because you do get to learn about your people and how they, how they interpret things, even uh, incidents where nothing bad happens. You get a sense of how they see the world, the fire world. And sometimes they'll surprise you. Sometimes they'll be a lot more um, safety minded than maybe you would have been at that incident. I mean, like you said, the, the, the hard thing about risk is, is how, how do you define what an acceptable risk is? Because it's, it's viewed so differently. Like I, I can, mm. I can just look at my own incidents where I go back and I look at an incident where I didn't perceive myself taking any risk, and, and in hindsight, I said, "Well, I took a lot of risk," and, and vice versa, where I said, "Well, that, I think that um, um, I should have done something differently because I, that I, that house would have." Or evidently was standing half an hour later, and no problem. It wasn't the risk for collapse and so on. So you have this, you have this. You can only, you can only try to decide risk, of course, in, in the moment now. And when you stand there, and and I mean, the fire service is is getting overall. It's it's the same in every country. We're, the fire service is getting more risk averse. Like you know, it, the willingness to take risk goes down. And for a lot of it, it, it is for, of course, good intention, and it's, it's statistically the, the right way to go and so on, because there's, there's uh, not a lot of, you know, benefits towards loss and so on. But you have this where, where, where there is a line, go like, what is, what is healthy not taking stupid risk, and what is plain right not doing what we're supposed to do? Of course, so, so there is a line there. In Sweden, I would I would definitely say, and I, we've had this discussion many times, that we have de definitely passed the line where we are we are letting way too many buildings burn down now, nowadays because of people not realizing the potential of a host line, for instance. They think that things are lost because they haven't, they don't really grasp because they, they, they're not, we don't have as many fires as we used to and we're not doing live fire training in the way that we should do in the most difficult budget and so on so people especially the last 10 years people have lost i would say that they've lost the comprehension of what a a, a good line can do in the, in the proper position it can put out a tremendous amount of fire <laughs> mm -hmm. tremendous amount sure. of fire um sure. So we've moved too far. I would say we we've moved way too far, and maybe not way too far. That was that was the exception. We've moved too far against people, not necessarily because they don't want to take risk, but be, because they don't know what they're capable of. So, the, so the I think, and that's the, I think that's the 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 the, the consequence of. Of wanting to be safe, um, objectively safe, <laughs> makes us gradually, subjectively, way too safe. <laughs> like, like mm -hmm. the, the, we we're, we we don't we we we, f we lose our ability to adequately uh, do a risk assessment. Uh, so we just back off more and more and more into s s we're just going to do nothing instead. Now, I'm over exaggerating a little bit, but I know that this is the same discussion in the United States. Well, uh, yeah, of course. Um, back in 2009, I did a speech at FDIC. Oh, it's famous. And, I've heard it. <laughs> right. And um, so um, basically, I called for a culture of extinguishment mm. and not a culture of safety. So that was a big takeaway for a lot of people, that, that uh, one sentence. But... The, what I've seen since uh, in the United States is a is an embrace an embracement of the engine and its importance on the fire ground and almost to the point of this is like the decade of the engine company or you know or at least oh, the sure. beginning of this decade certainly and this buildup has taken over ten years but 
um, uh, we're seeing that people are examining um, not only the power of what they can do with a certain amount of water, uh, what about the different hose stretches, how can we get to someplace faster, uh, in the United States, uh, a lot of different hose loads yeah. uh, to uh, to use, depending on you know your jurisdiction and what your SOPs are. So it's sort of like a renaissance for us. And then, of course, the uh, UL studies have kind of um, uh, meshed with this a little bit and has helped this go even further along. So to me, as I explained to you earlier about the time when we went straight into the fire at the low level and basically provided fire attack quicker, uh, that basically took care of or managed at least the egress issue. For So um, a lot of that now, the thought is a lot of handline coverage, which we've seen, which I, which I don't have a problem with, is um, can also be direct fire extinguishment based and let the egress take care of itself instead of defaulting to egress based where we may not get fire extinguishment as rapidly, uh, that coverage, we would get the egress coverage, but it might be more difficult to get the fire out. So anyway, um, I see on the horizon, a lot of change in the American fire service between uh, the various hose sizes, nozzles, things like that. And years ago, um, uh, you know, this the engine the engine company operations in the United States were were second class citizens. Basically, yeah. now the engine <laughs> has basically yeah, the engine, everybody in the world wants to teach the engine now, which is kind of funny. It's just you know it is what it is. But um, we're seeing. Uh, the culture, a strong extinguishment culture takes care of a lot of safety issues on the fire ground. It really does. And that was the idea behind that sentence. It was that, you know, it was a, a call to arms, basically, like we're going to safety ourselves out of business. But if we can develop a better extinguishment culture for ourselves, we don't have to get tied up in all yeah. these things. These things don't have to be bothering people because you know what we're going to take care of both with one yeah. because the other won't take care of the fire that's the problem so when you have uh, uh good stretching policies and you have uh knowledge of uh when to open up the line and you know what is your hose line doing all this stuff just builds up information that can be put in textbooks that can be put in department procedures that everybody can learn and uh It'll make us all better at our jobs. So I'm very happy that um, a lot of the American Fire Service, at least, is paying attention. They're not all they're not paying enough attention, but they are paying attention. Well, I, well, I have many questions about that one, but but the first one to start with is like if you take resale, like rescue primary objective. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, nobody argues that rescue is the primary objective. I mean, that's the Correct. same for all over the world. There's no, I've never heard about the fire service who's called like, no, we're going to value property more. Like rescue has always been the primary objective. What right. is the real discussion is, of course, how do you achieve rescue? For instance, you know, like, do you go for fire track and knock the fire down and automatically achieve rescue because you don't put out of life in danger? Or you, with, with, with fire tech, you can do ventilation by removing ventilation. By removing the smoke, you, you limit exposure and so on. So... Mm -hmm. It's been a, it's, I've seen it. And I find it very annoying uh, that there's discussion about. Um, it's not the it's, discussion is not about the objective, which some people, a lot of people online, want to make it about. Like it, it's, a, it's about like, well, what we have, we, we need to go for rescue first. That's that's our mission. Go like nobody argues anything else. <laughs> what people are arguing is how do you go about doing rescue? Like. In Sweden, we, we, we um, I mean, we of course, have to rescue some objective, and, and that is that has been synonymous with search. Like you go in there and search, mm -hmm. and and it's been a very slow progress. And I really went that I, I really wish that would have been faster to get like to the bottom line. And I don't think we're there even yet. But people, for instance, Australia made that switch long ago. Like if you have one team, which is the norm for Sweden. Like you have one team and you have to decide what should that team do, two firefighters. And they're like, 
-hmm. next team is five minutes away or 10 minutes or 15 minutes away, depending on where you are. So the first thing, what's you gonna do? You can't do everything, you have to do once. And, and, and for a very long time, that first team went in with rescue as a priority, meaning tied, and then automatically that was tied to search. So you go in a search and mm -hmm. should, you, should you find a fire, put water on it. Now, because in Sweden you never search by a host line, it's against our regulations. So okay. you have to have a host line. But, but anyway, you didn't go for the fire, you went for search. And only if you know, fire arrives, you can put some water on it and you continue to search. While in Australia, who switch on a grander scale and more, you know, like formally said first, first crew go in and they do fire attack. Because, mm -hmm. you know, like, well, if you stumble on a victim, you, you, of course, pull them out. But your main objective is to kill the fire because that's the thing that's killing people like everything else. And Sweden has, and I've been part of that struggle for the last five or ten years, really on a grand scale switch that to extinguishment culture you know like we we need to put the fire out and i would say that that's the norm now you put the fire out and if you have of course another team coming they can start doing search but otherwise you have to fight the fire first again generically there's much of situations that's not possible you fight the fire mm -hmm. first to be able to ventilate and then start to search as quickly as possible and this the debate about what to do first it's a very interesting one, but it's it's constantly dumbed down towards we need to rescue people first because that's what we're here for. But like, who are you trying to convince? Who are is there anyone out there saying something else? And, and I, I don't know if I, I'm talking to like if you don't understand what I'm talking to, but I I, I sense this all the time. Yeah. Well, that's the internet. Yeah. <laughs> there. Yeah. Well, I mean, this, I mean it started. Yeah, I mean, you can get a good sense of what's going on, and you can also get a false sense of what's going yeah. on through there. I, I see the same thing you see. Um, I'll just say that for the FDMY, our policy has been for since I came on. Um, if we have two companies responding, an engine and a ladder company, the ladder company's job is to perform a search, but the initial search is uh, for the fire. So we always put the officer and two firefighters at the apartment door. They get into the house and they perform a search to try and locate the fire. Yeah. That's job one. For now, the granted, truck. yeah, for the yep. For the Doesn't truck matter company. if the truck is first or second. Well, let's just stick with the first. Okay, stick with the first. Okay, okay. Yeah. We'll stick with the first two truck. Um, so the first two truck goes in there and they have uh, a water can. And but, that's well, just to it. clarify, that's when you say yeah. first your truck, do you mean that that's the first truck that arrives? Or do you mean that's the first unit that arrives? No, that's the first ladder company. That yes. Arrives. So they could be yeah. an engine company already on yeah. site. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, that's and, I'll what what, so. and I'll cover what they would do yeah. first. So let's just say a ladder company arrives even solo. Yeah. They don't have a, a hose line. So they're mm. going to go in and they're going to follow their standard thing. They're going to. Um, but let's just say the engine is there at the same time. So anyway, they're going to go in there and they're going to perform a search. They have a water can with them. So they have a limited ability to either isolate or knock down a fire, yeah. whatever it might be. But their first task is not to look for anybody. Their first task is to find the fire. Now, typically in a house, that'll take you through the hallways and, and things yeah. like that, yeah. typically. So if you run into somebody who is trying to get out and is in the main egress area, you're going to run into them. Yeah. So uh, that helps. So that kind of solves two things. So find the fire fitting engine if it wasn't obvious and find the pathway to it for them when they come in. You can give them yeah. that intel at the door. So that that has worked for us for a long time. So we've always had um, firefighters in the area, in the fire area, without a hose line. So we we do search. So, sorry, so another question if you want to that. Did, did that change or did it make any modification to that with the introduction of thermal imagers or no. was the thermal imager just enhancing that that operating procedure right you could do a uh, different type of you could do an oriented search the officer could hold the camera typically the officer had the camera yeah and uh, basically he would he would, he would point out you go that way you go that way you go that way yep. but the priority yeah, that was, was still find the fire and if we're lucky we find people. and then worry about people yeah. on the way yeah. back so Let's just say the officer didn't find a fire. 
but one of the firefighters did. They would just report back to that person and say, listen, the fire's over here to the left, whatever. Okay, the engine has come up with the hose line now. Okay, listen, it's down here to the left. So, but the first priority is not life. It's finding the fire for us. For well, us. I, I mean, for well, it's poor defined. Your first, your goal is to save life. Yeah. But your first right. task is yes. to find the fire. fire. Right, which kind of does both. Yes, it does. And that's the, the, the thing is, that that's, I think, where the hiccup comes from, is that lack of, lack of, it's just words, of course, but, yeah. it, but it means a lot. <laughs> words matter. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, that's why, you know, discussion is much yeah. better than a sentence. But, um, yes. you know, so one of the things that they'll do is, um, for us, and, you know, we're seeing it with the UL study, this latest one, is, is, um, Early entry into the space is becoming very important, obviously, for, a, you know, you, you, we can't find the people if we're not in there. The earlier you go in, the more likelihood that you'll find them faster. All right. That being said, so we've been doing that forever, basically. So now if the engine comes up on a fire all by itself, um, they are not really to search. They are to stretch a line. Only in a rare case would an engine get involved in a search operation and not stretch a hose line. Now that doesn't mean that they couldn't do both. It's possible that they could do both split the crew and say, you know what, somebody go with the officer. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to try and find this fire because that's the first thing. I'm going to try and yeah. find this fire. And then somebody else will stretch the line, but that's a rare case in the FDNY because of, you know, because of the location of firehouses and things yeah. like that. But it is possible to operate, by yourself for a while in certain locations and under certain circumstances. But again, early entry, get somebody in there to see where the fire is and then uh, conduct a search f back from that location. Well, now, has it always like a, been, sorry if I'm interrupting you, but you, yeah. you say too many interesting things. Um, <laughs> like, like you just said, and I, I just immediately had to stop you there. Uh, searching from the engine company back or from the fire and back mm -hmm. like if you if you're if you're a ladder company and your your job is let's say you do primary search would fdny search would they go into the the engine company search back or would they go all the way to the fire and search back well i mean do the fire understand? could be close to the entrance too which means yeah they could be but i mean let's say it's beyond you know, there, but, yeah um but basically find the fire and work your way back can you go past um, the fire? You can. Yes, you can. There's no, there's no, you, if you deem it to be safe and so on, you don't have to have somebody um, checking of, the fire behind you or. Well, yeah, no, somebody has to check on it. Uh, when I, when I, you know, I've been a ladder company officer. Did, when you do that, I always felt that my place was by that fire room so that um, if the extinguisher was left there, yeah. I hadn't. You know, send a firefighter past there. That's not a problem. But when it's time to come back, you need to come back and yeah. we can hold this at bay. And the other thing we would do is um, we would take a door off one of the rooms that wasn't involved and just drop it to the floor. So now this door is available to cover up this opening to limit the amount of fire coming into the hallway of this yeah. house where awesome. you can go back and forth. So. So there are some techniques you can use. Obviously, you don't want that window taken in that room. But yeah. once you pop that door, you have, you know, in case the door was already yeah. burned. So, yeah. So there's some things that we've done over the years that are pretty common knowledge for most FDNY firefighters on how to do something like that. But, um, you know, our search thing has always been um, in, in why, as the first thing we do. Yeah. Why? Why from the fire and back and not from the entrance in like has it well, always been like that and what was no, what was no, been oh, the... let me let me let me let me explain that one to you yeah. so you asked about the second do ladder company usually ah, yeah. they're usually they're assigned to the apartment above yeah so they're in the area directly above where the original fire is located at least initially yeah would they're, it be the same would it be the same if there's a house or a, an apartment yeah yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much, pretty yeah. much. So they are assigned to search, let's just say, the apartment directly above the one that's on fire. Yeah. Similar layout, everything, we'll yeah. just say. They search from the door in. Yeah. 
they do a, a, a search from the door in. They, their search is different. Yeah. They're not necessarily looking for the fire. They're doing a search. Yeah. You know what I mean? We, okay. Not that we're not looking around when we go in. Of course we are. You always yeah. have to look yeah. near the entry door. Yeah. But the point is their search is a little different. Now, granted, most times they'll probably try and go to the area directly where the fire was above that yeah. because if it is extending – there's a possibility that, that room only has a limited amount of search yeah. time available. Yeah. So, but basically their thing is to go from the door forward and then come back if they so need it, a line or whatever it might be. So it, do I understand this correctly that the first, the, the first two ladders search from the fire and back because their first objective was to find the fire. And when they find the fire, now they continue to focus on searching for people. Correct. So it's it's a matter of matter of that as being the reason, not because it makes more sense to search close to the fire. Well, it does make For sense people. to search close to the fire, but task one is find the fire. Yeah, I mean, That's okay. okay. Because I mean, it's it's a hard. I mean, so they have a mission when they go in there. Yeah. Now, granted, they, they want to save people, obviously. Oh yeah, that, 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 we're not debating but, that. But again, if we can't locate the fire, this becomes an issue. Oh, yeah, an I, mean, issue. I am I am I am a firm believer of fire suppression is rescue in most cases and safety yeah, well, as well. You know, Recio, uh, you know, uh, Lloyd Lehman came up with that yeah. years ago. And uh, I don't know that it was part of our educational process yeah. in the FDM. I could be wrong, but I don't recall it. Yeah. Um, and so. I think when it got moved to a command function, that's when people started raising their, their, uh, you know, their hostility yeah. against moving it. Uh, um, I think when it where it currently was where it had resided for decades was perfectly yeah. fine. And I think when they tried to shift it into a command yeah. area, that's when people started saying, "Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute!" So, well, I mean, yeah. again, if you if you interpret it as a as a as a task list and mm -hmm. you attach search to rescue, I think we have a major problem. Mm -hmm. Like, well, every, every, all firefighters arrive first should search automatically as a first assignment to do to, for rescue. But like, no, no, that's not, that's not all how I would like to operate. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know what his, uh, uh, you know, his thought process was exactly, but you know, for us today, most most small departments, at least, are getting an engine company on scene. They're not yeah. getting a lot of company on scene. So, for them, the job is fire attack. It's as simple as that, and try and manage a search off of that as best you can. So, yeah, I man, I, I, I absolutely agree. And I think um, um, when we talk about the, the the fire attack, and and there's multiple discussions we can have about fire attack, <laughs> but the connection to to again rescue and in what are you trying to do i was i was you know every time you ever to teach something which i like to do i mean i find teaching is is very valuable um because it's for many reasons but it also because it clears my thinking because if it if if i want to understand something uh, the, the the best way of me recognizing that I, can't, I don't understand it is if I can't explain it well. Okay. I think if I try to explain something to to someone and they don't understand it, mm -hmm. I don't understand mm -hmm. it well enough. That's just mm -hmm. that's basically sort of simple. So when I try to understand and I explain rescue, it took a long time for me to say uh, rescue is a function of search but search search is a function of ventilation you need you need ventilation to make the search go faster you need ventilation to for to for, to reduce toxic gases to make sure that they survive and ventilation is a function of fire attack i mean it is it is generally in that order you can't massively ventilate unless you have some control of the fire and you can't do a good search operation unless you start to ventilate um, so it so it becomes this again for me generically 
this rollout, you have to do fire suppression so you can get a ventilation going early so that you can do search. And it's, that becomes more and more critical the, the fewer you are on the fire ground because uh, you can only do one thing. You, you can't, if you start to search, fire does whatever the fire does, it just gets worse and worse and worse. That's not an option for most cases, okay? So you start with ventilation. That might work until it does. <laughs> right. Well, like, I mean, like you, you take a, you, I'll give you this example for uh, rescue versus uh, fire extinguishment. So you have a fire that is, um, has the main egress part of a, a house or let's say an apartment house. And I have a picture of this from somewhere. Yeah. Um, this is, Basically, no one can get out now. This is the first floor of an apartment house it's on fire, whatever happened yeah. there. So now <laughs> you could people are going to be pushed to their into their apartments. They're going to go out. They're going to run back into their apartment. Maybe there's smoke migration into the apartments yeah. as well. We can't rescue all those people at the window fast enough. No. What we need to do is put out the fire. So. I don't want to get too crazy about Recio. I mean, like I understand kind of where his head was at. That's what he, he basically meant life is what I think he meant by it. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, life so. is always number one. So obtaining that, uh, obviously, you know, like I said, you know, it's not something I worry about too much, but I think there's a lot of time. And that's a perfect example of, in that case, we need a, we need an operating line because that fire is outperforming even the biggest fire department's arrival. In other words, even the FDMY can't put up enough ladders for that one. Yeah. It just, <laughs> it's not going to work. Yeah. Uh, even, maybe I should say Boston. I don't know. Maybe yeah, Boston. I, I was just going to say Boston might. Fire might fire so. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there are times when it's obvious and there are times when it isn't. So, like, for us, for our engines, they're under the guideline that, listen, only an extreme, like it really have to be an extreme thing. And you'd basically have to prove this case. Why didn't you stretch a hand line? You know, and that's your function. That's your best bet. Uh, doesn't mean you couldn't break someone off and, and try and do something. Yeah. That, that, that's a possibility too. But uh, this is the problem that understaffed fire departments sometimes encounter is the fire where you have to make a choice. And I, I have talked about that in classes I've given. And that's a tough one. But you also have to understand the value of your choices. If you don't understand the value of, listen, if I get this thing knocked down, maybe I've saved lives just by doing that. Yeah. But if I concentrate on trying to get this person and that person, and you know, meanwhile the fire is unchecked, is growing unchecked, we have a problem. And that can happen even with uh, hose line placement. A bad hose line placement choice can allow the fire to grow and grow and grow. And now all of a sudden we have people in jeopardy in the building. Our, our people, maybe there's nobody in the fire building. They already got out. Now our people is in je are in jeopardy because of a decision made that was the wrong decision. Put the line in the wrong position. And uh, we're basically dealing with a symptom instead of the actual incident. In other words, um, make another good example of that is the attack stairway door in a high rise. So having that open, let's just say, or the yeah. smoke that's migrating to that doorway is basically just a symptom of the fire apartment door. That door is not the issue. It's the fire apartment door that's the issue. Yeah. You're just dealing with a symptom. It's like if you let a fire go on the outside of a house and it's growing and going and going, you are not going to be able to stick a hand line out a window and point it 90 degrees down to the ground. You're not going to be able to do that to hit the base of that fire. You need a line on the outside of the house for that. That's that's it. So your line might be in the wrong position to take care of that. So, you know. Unless you have a garden hose. Yeah. Unless it has <laughs> a European line. garden hose. <laughs> yeah. Those are yeah. pretty good sometimes. I'll show yeah. you. <laughs> but no, because you said, you said, you made an example of, and I think that's interesting. Um, um, so if we if we um, take the example, like you said, you, you only have a, a limited amount of, of, of options as a first arriving engine. <clears throat> In Sweden, we have it's been forever. So it's it's we've always had a door person. 
like I said, we have we had the third person mm-hmm. because of legislation coming from diving. So we had a third person, yeah. and it's it's never been door control in the sense that uh, limiting auction to the fire span firefighters is. 30s or 40s and something in Sweden. It's, it's like it's, it's, it's been an integral part of the Swedish fire service, like forever. Mm-hmm. Now, did people always understand why? Maybe not. It was it was tied to legislation and every, all other things. Like there's, there's a package. It's rarely one thing that makes it happen. But anyway, so we have door control behind the engine company, and and it's always been debated. Um, first off, what's the purpose of the doorman? So you can you can say that, well, the purpose of the doorman is to be, in, in our legislation, a leader in that sense that they could guide the firefighters inside and they're the link between the, the officer and the firefighters inside. Sweden is different because officers never go inside. Oh, they can, but they usually don't. So mm-hmm. that's the link between the officer who tends to be on the outside and the firefighters inside. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but Sweden is strange in that regard. Um, but it's been has been the debate of should the fire door doorman stand there and control the door, for instance, limit oxygen and feed the hose line through the crack, or should the doorman be a, what has been considered an active doorman, going in, helping with tools, going out, talking with the officer, meaning physically not sitting by the door and closing it. Mm-hmm. Now you go like, well. A simple answer is just to say, well, they can do whatever they like if they deem it to be the most beneficial to close the door. If it's, a, if it's a rocking fire, they want to limit auction to the fire and helping the crew with suppression, not having an outlet behind them and so on. They can do that. Now, that's a simple answer saying that they can do whatever they like. But in reality, most firefighters today are, are sadly not well equipped to make that decision. So then you're left with the decision, should they always stay there and close door to every fire, which you would, could argue that that would be not be good for a lot of fires. And it would be good to other fires, depending on the, the fire behavior. Or should they never do it and, and make the fire attack harder and the fire might grow faster and so on. Um, so my question to you is, the issue of door control. Um, you talked about you as a as a rescue officer maybe use the door to, for instance, block off the fire if you go inside and pass it. Has it been? Mm-hmm. Has door control or what you might define as door control limit an auction behind firefighters the entry door? Has them been part of you of of New York's um, portfolio or, or toolbox? And is it today? It is today. Um, as for dropping the door and using it over a door entering the hallway, that of course is a, a bedroom door, an interior yeah, yeah. door. Yeah, that's not main behind entry. the firefighters. No, no, not the main entry door. Um, right. So uh, door control was talked about early on. I, I saw a memo from probably t- more than 20 years ago on it. Um, and a very experienced officer wanted door control and office, some officers followed that. Some didn't. Yeah. Um, I, I worked on the, uh, very experienced officers that didn't want the door closed. Um, and part of the reason for that was that, um, if you keep it locked down and then it gets opened and the fire changes dramatically, uh, or we have a rapid fire growth in the, in the apartment, uh, it could surprise us. We could be very close to where it grows. So that's an issue. What they preferred was let it just get whatever air it needed and we'll deal with whatever it is. So, but a steady growth without surprises rather than yeah, without, uh, without being, you got to remember the search team is in there first. Yeah. So if they close down the door, let's say we're keeping it at bay, so to speak. Yeah. And then it gets opened and they're there or they're in a spot maybe they shouldn't be or they were in a spot yeah. and now all of a sudden um, they have fire uh, endangering them. Yeah. That wouldn't have maybe happened if they left the door open completely. So, you know, it's but I will say this. The FDNY uh, several years ago uh, moved to a situation where 
the ladder company would go in, that search team we talked about, yeah. they would go in, but they would control the door. So the door would be closed. Um, and then the engine officer would get to that door and control it as well. And then we'd leave somebody at the door on the yeah. inside. The engine officer would come, take control of that door. So that ladder company firefighter is free to do search or whatever yeah. else the, his boss wants. And then the line gets there. Now the door can be opened. The engine moves in with the guidance of the ladder company and the fire attack starts basically. So once our door, line door control up to where the fire, fire attack starts. Yeah. I would say for the most part, the door control would be suspended. The door closing yeah. would be suspended once fire attack, meaning the engine moved in. They yeah. didn't necessarily open a hose line yet. They yeah. didn't open a nozzle yet. But um, I think at that point, m there might be some firefighters that are going to try and cinch down that door a little bit as the line moves in. But most are going to be more concerned with uh, trying to get the line in there, yeah. uh, you know, to help feed yeah. it in to be that door firefighter. So I would say at that point, our concern about the door being closed uh, is not as worrisome because we have a hand line in, in, yeah. inside now. So I would so, say that would be the typical yeah. uh, operation. So follow up question on that. So, do you have any guidelines as to where, in which scenario when the first ladder truck goes in, or if the the parts of the engine is faster and the hand line is not in place yet, but you know maybe the captain is up there or something, uh, at which point is it emphasized that you should do door control? I mean, we can go all the way down to, uh, you know, cooking. Well, they want it. They pretty much want it all the time. Not for time. A, a, not for a, uh, something on the stove obviously but uh you know if we have a working fire if in, it is a working in the apartment fire, you know the, a room on fire they, yeah. they they want that door closed down uh now it does a couple of things it limits the amount of smoke in the public hall yeah remember the engine company has to come up there stretch yeah. a line in that case they could stretch it dry more than likely yeah. so they're going to stage outside of that apartment uh, and get water in their line and then come inside. Yeah. So it has a couple of benefits for us. It keeps the smoke out of the uh, public hall, keeps it out of the stairways. So it limits it that way, which speeds up the engine operation. So it's not a horrible thing. Um, it's not a big ask. We can put a firefighter there uh, or whoever wants to be there. Maybe yeah. the officer takes that spot and uses the thermal imaging camera to direct the search. Yeah. They're not tied to the door, so to speak. They can do a search nearby, but they want them there just in case anything happens. Yeah. Uh, they have control of that door, and we have a meeting point, basically. Yeah. So how do you... But ventilation of that area is controlled. In other words, whatever happened, uh, happened already. In other words, if a window yeah. failed, that's the fire doing it. It's yeah. not us. So we coordinate the ventilation of that fire area. Uh, between the engine and the ladder company uh, it's nobody's breaking the glass until they're told yeah so what would be let's say you have you have door control in the, the apartment engine company arrives they dry stretch out outside the door they move in and from that point it might be a little bit door control but mostly open um, and then at which point where is the who makes the decision and what's the sort of the guideline for when do you start ventilation after fire time? Uh, well, they'd like water on the fire room, ideally. So how, ideally, how do you know that that's the fire room? Is well, that like, well, I like mean, it, sometimes it's hard to, if you did you know, multiple fire rooms and so on. I, I think I like, as long as you catch the forward space of the fire, yeah, probably okay. Um, so would that be the captain of the fire. engine who makes that call or like yeah, it could be the engine. Engine. usually the engine officer would make that call, say, you know what, take the windows, but uh, it might be the ladder company officer. But once they start fire attack in the fire room, it, it's not a problem with taking uh -huh. the, with venting the, venting the room if it hasn't been vented already. Yeah. And so, a lot of times the fire has vented one of the windows already. Yeah. So they have a general idea where the fire is and, you know, remember the truck was up there looking around, so they might have an idea that it's, they'll report back. We have one room 
on fire yeah. or two rooms on fire, whatever it might be. Yeah. So in general, it works pretty good. It's all done via the radio. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a radical departure from anything we did previously. It's still pretty much uh, what we had done is just a little emphasis on controlling the door initially. And then again, once the line moves in, they, they, ideally they're going to hold off a little bit on that um, uh, ventilation of that room just in case there's some issue in the hallway. Let's say the line can't get down there. We have a cluttered yeah. condition. Uh, we don't want to battle that with an extending fire. So, Yeah. Uh, so when I teach, you always get this question, like when should you do it and everything? And without saying like it depends, um, uh, I usually talk about like if you want suspenders and a belt, like you want the safest option. I you I I use uh, um, I'm below 150 C with a tick, meaning you don't see any hotter smoke tick. It's not a thermometer, but it's an indicator. You don't see any hotter spaces above you with tick, and you don't see any flames in the fire compartment. That would be like the firefighters' cue for we want ventilation. Like, um, from that on, you go like, okay, can you have a little bit of flames on the floor? Of course you can. Like, but how do you teach firefighters not to say, oh, I've started to use water, but I don't know really how it's going yet. Let's start to ventilate and hope it, it, hope it will sort out. So do you have any, like, when you talk to, to firefighters and officers, like, like how, how does it feel when this is going great, now want ventilation on the fire compartment. Well, I think we often um, flow water before we ventilate. Yeah. I think that's very common. Yeah. Um, we're probably trying to condition the entry hall to this uh, bedroom, let's say. Yeah. And um, so we'll open the line prior to getting to the fire room. So for us, uh, we're getting some cooling already. And I think it's just a matter of, them feeling that and um, then realizing where this room is. And if they have some visibility, that's even better, but yeah. often that's not the case. But um, I, I, I think the ventilation, I won't say it's, uh, I would never say it's not necessary, but if it's delayed a little bit, I don't think it's the end of the world. The problem is if it's, if it's, uh, if it's done prematurely and you can't get to your objective, then it becomes even more of a battle down to get to your objective. So uh, when I did, I did a lot of live burns um, as an instructor at houses and things like that. I mean, uh, yeah. I've done my share of that. And we used to always wait till that line, till we saw physical evidence that water was being put in that room. And then we would have the uh, firefighter take the window. Yeah. And we never had any complaints uh, from anybody that they were taking uh, too much heat because of that. Because as you know, if the room isn't ventilated, the fire is probably not as hot as it would have been had the window been missing. So the heat you're going to take is is not as bad. And I mean, you have to expect a certain amount of heat anyway. Yeah, that, no, I, I totally agree that. I mean, a lot of a lot of times where where you're experiencing a lot of heat is when you have. Um, full pass coming at you and you don't know about it there is there is a window open somewhere sometimes and and one argument i always get is well you know um it doesn't really matter if you get ventilation too soon or in most cases it doesn't matter and i and i agree like most most times you know early ventilation just is just good like it your early ventilation before suppression works great the problem is that it's very hard to know when it's not going to work great. Like that's mm -hmm. very hard to teach. Like how, how do you, like if you go into an apartment fire and you, and firefighters are, I mean, if you go back in Sweden, it would be very good. Like if you do search, you break windows as you search. Like you don't know where the fire is and really what you're doing, but you just start breaking windows. And usually that works. Like mm -hmm. usually, it, you know, usually, yeah. you know, they just get yeah. better. Until yeah. it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and some people are like, well, if the fire starts to build up, we just put some water on it in that case. That's fine until you break windows and you realize it's, it's 15, 
a 50 miles per hour wind or was you know kilometer i don't know what to... it's it's high winds outside have you well, checked for that before you break the window and now you have a flow path that you can't control no people haven't that and to teach firefighters to take into account for instance wind driven fires is just it's just too much well yeah but i think that's a big one um that is a concept that they have to have to learn um well they have to learn that but when they they have to understand wind driven fire i absolutely agree but if 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 you arrive to a, an apartment fire and you roll up and down on the street it might be almost no wind at all and you, there's nothing broken you don't see any smoke there's no indication that there's there's a lot of wind up there and you go up there and you start breaking windows because there's a reported person missing it's the first thing you're going to pop up in your head is wind driven fire for most firefighters don't know it's going to be you know how can i get rid of this smoke it's in the way i need to search and and that's where you go like well if if you have in the back of your head don't ventilate before you have water on the fire as a, as a ground rule um you automatically t of course take away that risk too but, right but again yeah. you, so you, there, right there are some ground rules and there's some um uh, concepts that we are we're teaching firefighters today uh of just that now one of the things that i i'll pick up on what you just said there about taking the window to enhance your search um i often wondered if search wasn't enhanced back in the day well they did they would take a window and they'd stick their head out the window and get a fresh breath of air <laughs> so you wonder if the reluctance to use scba doesn't come a little bit from from that and then the fact that firefighters feel very claustrophobic wearing an scba face piece and it makes them uncomfortable so yeah. the sooner they get the smoke out of here the sooner they can take the face piece off. But the problem is they are concentrating on looking for a window now instead of looking for people. Yeah. They shouldn't be bothered by the confinements of the face piece, and they really shouldn't be that uptight about the smoke condition. To be searching for the window, to take the window to make your search easier, delays the search. So uh, there's always something underlying all these things that why firefighters act the way they do and, and but i think you need some ground rules if ventilation is delayed we'll get by if it's premature it could cause an issue yeah. and the wind driven of course is is a big one obviously um because once we know that that occurs and we're we're in that path there's nothing we can do about it except get out of that path that's really all we can do um i did a a live burn in in Oklahoma years ago and we probably had a 20 mile an hour wind on one side of that house and to make sure that nobody took a window we put plywood over the windows <laughs> we just couldn't have anybody do that it did the wind was blowing on one side of the house yeah. like crazy and we just couldn't have that yeah. option so we covered it up and took it away so you know fire departments have to put out rules for us our high rises for decades are commercial building fires or high rise office yeah. building you didn't take windows that was it. you just didn't take a window that was the that was the format we followed because you know they just didn't want that done uh so people just accepted it yeah. you know i think when you some rules um you know we're trying we try not to make too many rules on the fire ground but uh because not all of them can hold up to the scrutiny but for high rise office buildings, that one has held up for years, decades. Yeah. Would you, yeah, I mean, like the, like the, from the NIST studies with the, the blankets, uh, the fire blankets over the windows, mm -hmm. are they actively yep. used? Um, we do use them on occasion. Um, I know it is not a lot of times you have to use them, but no, but, but there are sections of New York City that, uh, especially by the water, um, I've heard of places where, if they have a fire, they certainly actively investigate whether that needs to be yeah. uh, deployed, maybe more quickly than other places, because yeah. they know that they get a wind off the water, uh, wherever it might be. So 
Um, that one, that one is carried by the ladder companies as a yeah. first, uh, first due ladder company. A member is assigned to carry that into the building for a uh, high rise yeah. fire. Um, so it, it is available. One of the interesting things that, you know, uh, cold weather climates yeah. and there's a, a, a thing my buddy has investigated, uh, is, um, the, uh, the fact that it, some of these fires are not wind driven in the winter, they're stack effect driven. Yeah. And that's something the fire service needs to look at a little bit more. We'll have a fire on a lower floor in a 30 story high rise and have, have uh, let's say the apartment door is open. So now we have a flow between the wind, a failed window and the apartment door into yeah. the hallway. And basically it's like a wind driven fire, but it's not wind. It's the stack effect. Yeah. It's the building pulling in air on its own and creating basically the same effect. We had that in a, in New York City. I know of at least one uh, where they deployed the blanket, even though the person deploying it was like, why? Why am I doing this? <laughs> yeah. And they did it, and the engine was able to get down into the apartment, but otherwise was stalled. So um, I think that's a fascinating uh, – that kind of fascinates me how that – ends up working uh so yeah. you know we have to be careful in a cold climate uh what's going on you know with the uh, lower floor fires especially yeah i mean when you open that door it could be a surprise <laughs> yeah yeah so i had a i had a potentially wind driven fire in a high rise i had a a balcony fire and i opened the door to the fire apartment and got pushed the door got physically pushed back it was hard to open anyway got physically pushed back and I knew that the balcony door was gone. Now, yeah. there was no condition in the apartment as well. So I took the hint. I knew there was an adjoining balcony so that we could, we checked out the apartment next door. We were able to bring our hand line in there. And then we were able to put out the fire. But I basically took the hint. And I yeah. told the chief, I told the incident commander that, you know what, we're going to make sure nobody goes in here or tries to even go in here because we have no protection against this thing. And, uh, you know, we know. We have a history with this, so we know and we're aware. So it worked out very well, and uh, nothing happened of it. But I always tell firefighters, take the hint. Uh, you know, if it's pushing back at you and that's, you know, you're going to have a problem here. So you got to be very careful, especially a balcony fire. So when and it, you have a, now you have a special procedure for wind driven fires, or do you have a special, or is it? written in the normal guideline or is it a special it's uh in our high rise it's in our multiple dwellings and it's in our high rise bulletin that talks about um wind driven fires and the fact that you know basically we can't beat them with two two large diameter hand lines it's not going to yeah. work we we have to just basically close the door obviously that'd be ideal close the apartment yeah. door look at an alternative uh, entry point for the water because as you know, most of these things occur on a room that has a window. Yeah. So you might have a bedroom that that's why we have the high rise nozzle, basically a floor below nozzle yeah. that's angled uh, to get it into the window above. And that works very well. Basically uh, we're going to have more of those on every engine eventually. And basically that'll be on the first alarm and, I would venture to say in the future that that's going to be the second line stretched. Yeah. Because, well, the reason is you can only put, you could have extension above, and that's a possibility at a high rise fire, obviously. You know, um, not that it extends necessarily through the construction, but via the exterior, typically. So we could have extension up above, that's a possibility. But I think that at some point you have to, investigate that alternative water entry because you can't put a second let's say you're having trouble getting into the apartment for yeah. whatever reason the line is not advancing if you put a second one right behind it it's not advancing it's either kind of, no, it's they're, both, they're both stuck kind of because yeah. it obviously it's a shielded event something is going on it's keeping you from yeah. doing that and probably another line right behind you isn't necessarily helping as much as you might think uh it's probably what happens not the bowls of the firefighters on the line either yeah, no, and what happens is you get stuck in a, a thing for a while, uh, a procedure, and eventually it starts to work because 
the fire load has died <laughs> down. Fire goes you, know, you give it enough time, it'll die down. So, but I, I think that um, these fires, um, obviously smoke spread and the amount of people we have and, yeah. uh, you know, we're dealing, anytime you're dealing with a high rise fire, it's a different issue. When you're multiple floors above grade, everything's got to be transported up. It becomes labor intensive. So I, my own personal opinion, I could be a hundred percent wrong, but I think we're going to see that this, uh, nozzle be thought about as maybe the second line yeah. more than it is currently. But like I said, I could be wrong. No, I, for me, it makes sense. I mean, for me, it's just another version of, of, um, a piercing nozzle. I mean, the piercing nozzle is an integrate integrated part in the Swedish fire service, mm -hmm. both high pressure and normal piercing nozzles. I mean, ours are usually smaller than yours, <laughs> but, but mm -hmm. the, the concept, I mean, that, that is for all the, for all the shielded fires or hard to reach fires and void spaces and so on, where you don't want to open up because you want smoke spread. You don't want to open up because you want auction inside. You don't, you can't get in there because of hazardous goods or for that, for that matter, wind driven, but that would be a very unusual reason to do it, but it could be. I mean, the most part, part is just void spaces and, you know, attics and so on. Uh, but that's just not a common thing that, that, that the hard, but the hard thing in that being Sweden has been that, okay, so we have to change the perspective from the, the the interior attack with with the host line as the default option saying that there isn't a default option in most fire survivors it, it is it is a, it is a toolbox um saying that well if we have an attic fire how do we make sure that the in that case the piercing nozzle is the first option to be considered and if that doesn't work something else um so for like a floor below nozzle, I would definitely say that the interior attack is the default option, but it's very hard to change. When you say that something is default, I think it psychologically means that every other option is inferior or as a sign of failure of the first option. Like, and that, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Like it's 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 not a failure to use a floor below nozzle. That's the best option, maybe in some cases. And and and, and I think as soon as you call it, we had interior attack with a host line. That was that was the default option. And every other tool and tool thing in the toolbox was alternative methods. So just the word meant that sort of if you can't do this now here are the things you can try like you go like no some of those were much better than the first one you tried like you should have started with if there's an attic fire sure you can pull down the ceiling and get smoke down and you can put a water a, a nozzle in there and it probably works but if you put a small piercing nozzle up there and steam it out, you're going to have less water damage, less smoke damages, and so on. You're going to be more effective. That's the primary goal. But that has taken forever. Um, well, I, I, I'm not surprised. I'm not and surprised. I, and and I, 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 it, just one part is just the, the I think, the, the, the word you use, if you call it alternative methods, it's sort of mm -hmm. like, yeah that's not going to work. <laughs> I mean, we, we've, um, we've had tools in place for decades. We've had a Breslin distributor yeah, for ages on getting into basically into commercial sellers. That's kind of where it was designed for, um, places that we couldn't get down to for whatever reason, you know, it was developed, uh, at a time where SCBA wasn't, uh, maybe wasn't even around, uh, or, you know, to the, the way it is today yeah. but um so and a recent development is we have a cockwolf nozzle which while not a piercing nozzle in a sense uh kind of works similar version of that um we it splits its water it's like a t yeah, and it uh, it's, yeah well yeah, no you yeah. physically move it but um oh you yeah fix, oh yeah. yeah oh yeah it's just one that looked like a like a yeah. t yeah. yeah yeah it's like a t-shaped with uh yeah. two and a half inch tips and that, that's worked out pretty well um, there's going to be more use to that in the future. And one of our 
issues uh, with that is we're seeing that in when we go to commercial buildings, we have high ceilings. So it's very difficult for us to open those ceilings, obviously, mm-hmm. from the ground floor. And a lot of times fire gets in that void space between that ceiling and the roof space. So this uh, deployed on the roof from a safe location, obviously you can shoot water about uh, 50 feet. So that's pretty good. Yeah. And uh, so you can operate this from a safe location and uh, also me- uh, see if your fire is going out from maybe your primary vent hole. See if we're, we're getting to this thing. So it, it opens up choices for the incident commander. It gives us a second uh, alternate. Well, I, I will talk, I will say it's an alternative water entry point. I don't have a problem with the fact that um, we typically bring our line in to cover the egress or the most common pathway in a home or a business. Uh, no, now, that, obviously, no, depending on depending on the scale of the building, if we have a building that's 500 by 500, we we might we're hopefully going to look for a place that gets us <laughs> to the fire closer. But you know, as a as a default, or I shouldn't say default, as an action, you have to you have to be supported in your ideas. If you think, you know, you tell somebody, "Well, wait, let me go find the way, a better way in here." That's going to take a while. Yeah. It's just going to take a while. So, um, you know, I think we have more patience. We should have more patience with commercial buildings in the middle of the night, commercial buildings during the day, because most of the time. Most people get out of commercial building fires. Um, you know, I'm talking about stores and yeah. things on the first floor and things like that. But uh, occupied buildings are tough. Occupied buildings are, you have to do something quick. It has to be a reliable method. And for us, interior fire attack covering the main egress of that building is the primary way to go. Uh, if another option were to come up, it would be a secondary option because more than likely it has a limited value. Um, you know, if we can take a staircase that takes us everywhere, we don't want to find out that uh, we took a staircase that only takes us to half of the place. If you get yeah. what I'm saying, oh, yeah. you know, so, I mean, uh, I know people have uh, dinged bringing a line through the front door, but the reality is, you know, architects design homes based around the entry point and, uh, you know, your staircase is typically located close to there. Your hallways are typically located close to the main entrance. So the house makes sense to you. I always say you can bring a line to the back of the house and try and go in. But now you have to find your way to that hallway, which isn't necessarily easily mapped out for you. So and I'm talking about a small home. Yeah. So, uh, you know, people want to recreate the wheel a lot of times, but usually the wheel is all right. It just, it might be low on air, but it's all right. <laughs> well, uh, we can get to transitional attack. I think that's interesting. I think that one part, part where we, we have a disagreement on. But, but for, before we go there. Uh, uh, What's uh, transitional attack? I don't know. Oh, let's just uh, call it exterior attack. Mm-hmm. You know, we, well, I mean, I think it makes sense in the sense that you can transition from one from one place to another, but that's you can transition in multiple ways inside the building and outside and so on. But I don't know. But that, that, I mean, that's the use words. We we just call it exterior application. But oh, okay. we have Swedish, so yeah, it no, makes no. sense to you. <laughs> no, I know. Uh, well, it it if you, transitional fire attack transitional attack was originally not the current definition um, that we all know it today, it was basically you would transition from outside in, but it morphed into something else in recent years where um, it wasn't an example of basically knocking down fire to get in somewhere. It was about putting fire out in remote locations that have nothing to do with the entrance to the building. Yeah. That's kind of what it morphed into. Yeah. But that's the definition we have today, and that's the way it is. But, you know, it definitely power changed. So, power of social media. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think we are going back to exterior attack versus interior attack. I mean, the, the Dutch uh, actually uh, made up uh, uh, what I really liked. They had they had their, their decision quadrant, and uh, it was very nice of organizing thoughts. They have the... They have the offense, uh, offensive, not offensive, 
<laughs> I always mix, mix that up. Offensive oh. firefighting. That's firefighting oh. without clothes. Uh, that's offensive. <laughs> offensive. They, they mix it up to offensive, interior, offensive, exterior, and defensive, interior, defensive, exterior. I mean, meaning it's defensive or offensive if the intent is to go in or stay out. But if it's if it's offensive and it's exterior, it's with the intent of going in. If it's defensive interior, it might be your your inside, but you're defensive towards maybe another part of the structure and so on. Mm -hmm. I I really like that because it was it's very it's a simple green side. What stance are we in? We are in offensive exterior, mm -hmm. and we have to make some we have to make some the the build we have to make the building behave like Scott Corrigan says. We have to make the building behave before we can actually go in. We have to, you know, knock the fire down and, or, or even suppress it and so on. Um, so I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and that clears up um, some of the problems with saying exterior is defensive or, or interior is always offensive, which is not the case. I mean, again, you can have you can have a defensive interior attack, meaning that you're only protecting a part of the building make sure that egress is okay and then you evacuate maybe and that's a that's a defensive option but from the inside um, so in that sense if you if you're doing an exterior attack with the option of either going in yourself or maybe you're doing exterior attack for leaving someone else who's going inside that's an offensive offensive way of applying water now where you might end, where you might end up in a, in a disagreement is, I don't know about you and me, but it like <clears throat> some Swedish colleague says, water doesn't know where it comes from, and that's meaning the 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 context of that was you know like if you spray water from this side or this side it doesn't really know it's it all depends on where it's going, which is not true. Like, like water absolutely knows where it's coming from in the sense that it, for instance, might drag with air and so on. But the intent is the same. If if I'm spraying water into a fire compartment with the intent of 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 uh, getting to ventilation as fast as possible, that's certainly offensive. If my goal, because you can correct me if I'm wrong, because when I've heard you talk or, or say something about me, I think you said something like this. And please correct me if it's not. Um, so for rescue, we need to be inside. I mean, you have to be inside to carry someone else, to find them and so on. Um, to to get to the fire first or rescue someone first or protect them so on, you have to use the central hallways. You know, you know that's the best that's the best option we have of of get clearing as much, you know, getting to as much places as fast and finding our way, meaning through the, the front door. Mm -hmm. And if we, for instance, do a transitional attack or exterior attack on a room, and unless you actually actively go into that room and, and get water on all the surfaces, the knockdown, and I know, the, you know there's the definition of knockdown or knockback and so on, the 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 time it not it's knocked down or knocked back or whatever you know the words you're trying to make up new words it's fantastic Not it's, it's knocked down it's it's more lasting than knock back that's correct oh yeah but good, good so let's say you make only a, a knockdown and now now you've actively suppressed the fire so that you can transition and go inside and that takes for a while and hopefully the fire hasn't built up and maybe that allowed a faster in the end result maybe probably not because it takes a you know it takes a fairly you know you know it takes a lot of time to do the the exterior attack and and how much do you gain by doing more simple advance probably not a lot of time because most houses are fairly close to the fire compartment so are you gaining anything just looking at that maybe not but if you only achieve knockback, it says a little bit, then the fire starts to rebuild again. And when you get into the hallway, you have a rocking fire again. You definitely haven't achieved anything. You just delay time on the outside. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that would that sort of be a part of your argument? Or am I? I don't know. 
I don't know what the argument no, is. No, I don't. Would it make? Does it? What I said did. I what I say make sense? To, well, yeah. Well, towards the end, it did. Um, <laughs> yes, I know. So, so, so that. then the case. So that it's about it. It's it, it just takes away time from the interior attack, and I totally well, see that it, argument. It, yeah, it might. It would probably delay the interior attack. Yes. Yes. But, but now. But, but this is, think about it. A, it was always a it was always a time distance problem. It's a math problem. Yeah, it's yeah. Not, not an opinion problem. It's a math problem. Oh yeah, it's, absolutely. And you look at the fire tech study. It absolutely shows that you know, go interior achieves this faster than than doing it from the exterior, right? right? But that's what, and you know what? If people want to do exterior attack, that they can do that. But one of the things that's interesting is that uh, even when you follow the UL guideline of you know, high stream angle, you know, rigid stationary, yeah. you know, placement. Um, and you got a change in conditions. They didn't give you a time limit of how much water yeah. to put in. But you would see this change in conditions. And it, a lot of times it, it wasn't enough. You, all you were getting was a knockback for the, for the most part. In fact, yeah, they, were, you know, so, you know, it was like, all right, so we did this and – is this a wasted effort? That's really what you have to look at. Is yeah. this a wasted effort? And the other, the other half yeah. of this, yeah. hang on a second. <laughs> the other half of this, which was always a great catch line, and you you may uh, agree or disagree, I don't know, that it lowers the temperatures throughout. Yes. Okay. Uh, it does lower the temperatures. Yeah. But most of the house is in the green zone. So <laughs> What is this significant temperature that we're lowering? Yes, we're lowering the temperature in the fire room. Yeah. But we're lowering the temperatures for the balance of the house, which is inconsequential because those temperatures were never a safety problem for the firefighters temperature-wise. Yeah. So, but anyway, so... Uh, no, I can agree on that. I can agree right? on that. It's... Uh, it's... You have it, to be careful. Is... But you're not waste. You're not kind of chasing your tail a little bit. Yeah. So when we included in the second, um, in the coordinated attack study, they already had it in the water mapping. They yeah. talked about the lentil hit was yeah. something we looked at. So we used that as best we could in the coordinated attack. And that, uh, through their own diagrams, you get a better surface yeah. distribution on the water. It gave it a better hold time. And that wasn't something that was fully explored. But when you're out there and you're going to do that, why – it always seemed like it was a race to the interior. In other words, yeah. they did the transitional fire attack from the exterior, and then it was like, all right, let's hurry up and get in there and yeah. you know finish this thing off. And I was like, listen, if you're going to do it, dedicate yourself to doing it the best way you can and then bring your line in. Try not to make it a competition. Be you know what I mean? Because yeah. you're not going to win the race. We already we are already there yeah. doing our thing on the inside. All things being equal. So, so this is the let's say let's say I, I mean I don't have think have any problems with you I, I I recognize if you if you do it from the outside you probably whether or not you have knockdown or knockback you're probably going to delay the interior path to the fire room because you're still going to go to the fire room regardless right. so you're going to go to the fire room because you have to you have to knock it oh, out yeah. you have, you to have to, to yes so you have to go regardless of what you do you have to go to the fire room so. So probably you're not yeah, not making time to that effort, uh, and I agree with you that that it, it if you position your line there and you go interior, depending on how it looks, of course it, it depends on what, where how long it's going to take to go to the interior operation. It might be two minutes, it might be three minutes if you're going to go on some complicated stretch. But let's just take the simple example. Now, now where I think the the my caveat is if if I look at fire problem as my my goal is rescue to do rescue i need to ventilate and, and sorry my, my goal is rescue and to, to rescue i need to search and to do search i need to ventilate and to, to ventilate i need to uh, fire suppression sorry. yeah my wife came in and closed the door it's it's one o'clock in the night and she's probably <laughs> mad that i'm talking really loud because i'm talking fire that's very hard to talk quietly um <laughs> no, but if, if my goal is that, so let's say we do a, 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 a transitional attack, but my goal with the transitional attack is not to get to the fire compartment as fast as possible, it's to allow ventilation. So if I teach instead, let's say you do, you do, a, you do an exterior attack, and the first objective I have for my firefighters when they enter the fire compartments to do uh, 
an assessment of the of the of the hallway. So they just go just inside the door and get the tick up if they can't see anything used as an indicator. Does it look does it look uh, like we have fire extension? That's all I need to know. Like, do we have mm -hmm. fire extension somewhere, or does it look like that that was the bulk of the fire? That was the fire compartment. If they don't have an indication that we have fire extension, I can put the fan on straight away. Or if you want to use, you know, hydraulic ventilation or whatever, but but we use fans a lot, and, and, and I like fans in that sense. That means that I can start ventilation way before they are have arrived in the fireplace because I have that knockback or knockdown. Doesn't matter, both of them works to put the fan on. And I also don't, in my context, we have limited amount of firefighters, which everyone has in the first arriving engine. But I can have one firefighter standing doing the, the, the exterior attack, one firefighter going in two meters in, do an assessment of the temperature, and one firefighter preparing the fan. So that there would be the time. I don't, I don't care about the time getting to the fire compartment. I, in that case, I measure what's the time where I can commence ventilation. Regardless of how that ventilation performs, maybe it's a ladder company doing horizontal in your case. But, but if I measure that time compared to getting to the fire compartment, I guarantee that we have improvements. That means that when, the, when we actually, the firefighters on the outside, if they maybe stay on the outside, they just stay there and put the fire down. Even every, when they say they build up, they just knock it down again. Mm -hmm. Meaning I can start ventilation and then I can actually start search straight away. They don't have to go interior to the fire compartment or I can order them to go to the fire compartment so that the outside firefighter can transition to inside and start doing search. Mm -hmm. So, so I agree with you wholeheartedly. If your goal is to get to the fire compartment, then it might be a waste of time to do a transitional attack. But if your goal is to, to commence ventilation, which again, I think is the key to safety search, everything in a, in a search way, then it's not a, it's not a failure. Mm -hmm. Well, how much time do you think it would take to start the ventilation? I mean, and I'm not, I'm not pinning you to yeah, anything. Yeah, I know. You know, if you bring the line to the, to the bedroom there and you operate it, that's going to be 10 or 15, whatever it is, a certain amount of time. Yeah. And then you believe that you can start that ventilation pretty soon after that. So let's just say that's the case, yeah. that you can get everything done within a certain short period of time. Have you looked at what would be the difference if you went interior what is the big delay of starting the ventilation with that? Well, well I, I'm not against yeah, yeah. yeah. right, but I don't see. I don't know if it's been compared. They've been compared no. to. Well, yes, and no, no, not in the sense that, that like UL in a serious big study. Yeah. Right. Now, no, I think that that it, it is. It is partly, of course, you know, backyard science in the sense you do a test yourself, you well, do it on fine, the structure I, burns, or, and it's also part gut feeling. Of course, you, that's how you generally make decisions you take everything you kind of know and mash it together and see what what comes up but to me it, it is i mean but i think the if, same thing could be done i think the same activities could be done once the line is flowing oh yeah yeah yes i, 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 I one yeah. tempers the other Necessary. No, I, I i yeah no i, I agree I, I think that you absolutely when that line goes into the hallway and basically, mm -hmm. you're whipping it around in the hallway. Let's say, like the UL study, you're whipping it around the hallway. That's that's a cue for ventilation in in yeah. ninety nine point nine percent of the cases. Right. So, but but for me, I also have to take into account. Like, I would I like firefighters to be faster at deploying hose line, doing their initial door checks, like checking a seal and and the we Sweden connect, connecting radio, checking radio and so on actually going inside start flowing it it takes way much longer time in generally because most firefighters are not good at it than i want it to well of course understood uh, a firefighter standing outside doesn't have to be necessarily as suited i mean you know no they, you they're know, they're they're not on the level that you and i would like it to be <laughs> which well, which I means like and, and i mean like you know yeah. it's just, and, and that know, takes it so so when i compare it's very easy for too good to do, to get a, a primer line stretch to, for instance, a, a window and do an exterior attack 
Um, you don't even have to be on air most of the time to do it. Um, and, and to get that done could be within 30 seconds, you can have water on the fire. If I were to say, let's go interior, I mean, anything from a well-trained crew, maybe one minute bef when, the, when the engine stopped until they're inside, maybe one minute, but the reality is probably two minutes or three minutes. So that's two and a half minutes, uh, so, sorry, maybe two minutes of delay of getting water on the fire. And again, that's the delay I'm looking for. That's two minutes delay on starting ventilation or maybe even more. Um, so when I factor in that the world doesn't look like the way I would like it to be, I would like us to stretch hose line faster if I'm being generic. Like Sweden, like, like United States, when it's 80% of the United States are volunteers. Like how, how fast do they stretch an interior line and, and coordinate that ventilation? All right. So um, this, this option is there for people. Um, we have data on it so they can use it. It's it's actually um, good for understaffed departments, and they've probably been doing it for years anyway. Yeah. What what I would like to see though is that if you do do this and you get a knockback or you get it knocked down, uh, even with a low staffing, you should be able to go in and, f and finish it off. In other words, our two in and two out is predicated on uh, you know having two firefighters outside, like you're yeah. talking about the five team where you have that door yeah. firefighter. So, for us, the OSHA mandate of, um, you know, you can't go inside unless there's yeah. a known life hazard. I think um, while you can get a knockdown or, you know, maybe you can get a knockdown on this fire, but you're not allowed inside. That's crazy. Yeah. So I think if you if if people believe that this technique has value, yeah. put some teeth into it. Let's amend the OSHA two in and two out to allow these understaffed fire departments to complete their complete their fire operation on the interior and not be worried about this stuff. So I think, you know, the science is there to back that yeah. up. And no, if I you're going to do something, let's do something good for these understaffed departments because uh, the people there deserve a good quick search as well. No, I agree. I think that, I mean, our, our legislation is, is uh, we also have, basically, we have the minimum to do interior attack is two firefighters inside with a host line. Mm -hmm. And you need a door person, you need an officer, and outside you need a pumper. Mm -hmm. So you need five people. So, so that's, yep. we have even more than two in, two out. We have basically two in and three out. Um, mm -hmm. But it, the, the, I mean, the only reality is it's only the door person has an SCBA. So there's only one person who can actually do a, a quick, you know, you know, the assistance to the firefighters if there's something happens. Right, um, right. The other two are, like are. You did a exterior transitional attack. You know, you have some of the fire knocked back at least a little bit here. So we should, or you stay outside till you're you're happy with what's going on inside. Uh, the result of, yeah. of your activity makes you satisfied, and you should be fully allowed inside. Yeah, and I think so too. Again, like you said, the Swedish legation says you have to do that. But there's a caveat saying that that's only if there's a, you have to have that organization if there's, uh, smoke inside, heavy smoke. That's sort of interpreted like if you can't see the ceiling and the, the ceiling and the walls, that's heavy smoke. Like so, light smoke you can go inside. So it's heavy smoke, and there's risk potential risk for fire. It says that's what it's sort of. That, that's the definition. So like right. if you take a mine, if you have a fire in a mine, you would you know have uh, you know like kilometers or for you, miles, <laughs> miles mm -hmm. of, of entry path with just smoke and no visibility, but there's mm -hmm. no fire hazard. I mean, all that smoke is not going to ignite. It's, yeah. So there's no fire hazard, but that that is not considered smoke diving. You don't have to be two in, two out. You can you can go lean on it. You can, you can get away from that, and that's been settled in court. But the, my point is, if you knock it down from the outside, um, mm -hmm. And say I don't say I, I won't use the word limited department, but it's especially useful for those. If you knock it down from the outside and you say, well, sure, there's a lot of smoke in there, but we've taken away the risk for you know sudden fire to just blow out of people's heads. Like you know the the rapid fire progress is not going to happen because we knocked it down. Now I also think that that's that's a valid concern of saying that now it doesn't apply anymore. Now we can move in interiorly. 
mm-hmm. but regardless if you have that effect and what is you know recently did in norway with the department is you know like a small volunteer mom and pop uh, out on an island <laughs> and mm-hmm. they they're not allowed to do interior attack because they don't mm-hmm. have training and so on this is you know right. super small department and so we did a, a quite a structure burn but all we did was exterior attacks and and check the hallway using a mm-hmm. one step in they have scbas but they just can't do it right. if they don't see fire extension put the fan on wait it kind of may take you know a minute mm-hmm. but after a minute and they keep hitting it from the outside if it builds up in the fire compartment after a minute they start getting clear conditions in the hallway and they can move in with their regulations okay. so they're doing interior attack but 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 they 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 they, they make that possible with the exterior attack now right. A real department would make it a uh, real. That was a, a department that's allowed to do interior attack and has a staffing for it can do it much faster because, of course, they can move in before the exterior t- attack is made or during the exterior attack. And as soon as you have any knockdown or knockback on the fire, you would commence ventilation. Um, mm-hmm. And that coordination, meaning in my dream scenario, of course, and, and usually how the Swedish department practice is that maybe the driver takes the exterior hose line so he he drags out the exterior hose line start knocking mm-hmm. the fire down while the firefighters prepare the interior attack and and while they're when they're done with the interior attack and the preparations together with the officer there are four people doing that while one is attacking it i mean it's it's knocked down it's knocked back whatever you like so they can start they can just verify the hallway and start ventilation straight away mm-hmm. while they move to the to the Fire compartment, just make sure that it's knocked down, get some water on it, and then commence into search and rescue straight away. Right. And no, I, no, I mean, people are doing it every day. They, it's, uh, you, have an, you have a system uh, with the fan and, and somebody checking with the thermal imager. That, that's a good system. Um, the, the problem was not so much with transitional fire attack um, to me, it was the fact that we had no information on interior attack. And basically yeah. the yeah. jury uh, came back with a decision about how great transitional attack was. And yet they hadn't heard the other half of the case. So UL uh, did the fire attack study with the interior and exterior fire attack, which basically put interior fire attack on the map finally. And which was kind of crazy to think that we didn't have it because um, well, I, I can only speak for our department. Uh, we're probably 99 point whatever percent interior fire attack. So it was nice for us to get that information for wherever it might lead. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it turned out that um, I had asked uh, Steve Kerber to design the house a little differently in the fire attack study than the previous study. And that's where we got our long hallway from. Yeah. Yeah. The wit the the width was only three feet. Which yeah, was it was hard. a little bit narrow, but Very yeah, narrow. Get, get the point. Um, <laughs> and I asked about that, and that was taken from a previous drawing of the previous house. They had three bedrooms clustered yeah. together, and um, basically the hallway was only three feet wide, but the hallway was only probably four feet long. Yeah. So in the previous house, the architects used the same dimension, and they made it like 25 feet long. Yeah. So it was very narrow. But anyway, we had it. Um, I wanted it to replicate a lot of uh, uh, the apartments we have in New York City. And it also replicated, um, if you will, uh, a lot of home designs in the United States where the bedrooms are on the second floor yeah. or extended ranches. So it for the American Fire Service, that layout was uh, was a good choice. And we, we learned a lot about what went on uh, with our attack based on that house. So that house was basically a home run uh, for us, for the knowledge we gained from it. And to me, it validated what we do in the FDNY and and how we teach our fire attack. To me, it validated a lot of what's taught. Um, So uh, it had a lot of value. And the other thing that it did was it put interior fire attack on the map and and finally people could, could make a better informed decision as to which method they wanted to use now because as you pretty much can understand as a first attack line 
on the scene, if you do transitional fire attack, you basically limit it to uh, an advance on to the second floor, basically. Uh, that if you use it outside and shoot it into a window on the second floor, and now you're going to bring that same line up to the second floor. That's a lot. That's a big ask. Oh, no, um, no, it's not the same. Uh, that, that would, uh, I would say, uh, in my context, it would yeah, never be the same line. Ones. Yeah. You know, our hose lines are heavy when they're filled with water. So, uh, you know, inch and three quarter hand line. So, um, using it on the exterior for a third floor fire or a fourth floor fire where that stream might reach, you can't ask those firefighters, okay, take that line and no, bring no, it No, 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 not at all. But that, in that case, I mean, it, 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 to me, when I look at that, it would make even more sense with trans transition the higher up you go because that would be a second, that would, the first line, to me, the first line would go to transitional in that case, if you have fire blowing out of the third floor. But that would be a single firefighter with that host line. And then it would be basically three firefighters and the officer never does anything. <laughs> they go around looking at people and so on. But anyway, the three, three, <laughs> We call the fire the fire square in America. You got you know smoke. Yeah, then you got oxygen, heat, and and uh, and um, oxygen, heat, and fuel, and then your officers. And you take any one of those away, and the fire goes out. <laughs> I've heard that one. <laughs> but but anyway, so so one line goes to the transitional because that can affect the fire so much earlier. So the other three firefighters are preparing the interior line, which is you know the, the, another line up and do to do the interior attack to me it just makes even more sense to do a transitional attack the harder it is to make that other one but i would never use the same line to do it because that that line the first if you if you if you knock it down and you don't keep it knocked down it will regrow and that's then it's useless sure so the, i mean you you should never hope for you never you should never hope for extinguishment but you should you, should, you shouldn't even hope for knockdown no, no, you should hope no. for knock back. Yeah, at that's, most. that's what you're gonna get at the yeah. that that, that uh, height from yeah, the angle, everything. It's just, no, no, it's not. You know, you're gonna get knock back. But again, my primary goal is just if in my context is is mostly possible. I'm not saying it's ideal because you might have to do the pump operator to do it. But we can sort of live without the pump operator. But if the pump operator do the, the external attack and the interior crew prepares that and do you know, up the stairs and in, into the apartment, it's it's a it's a, for me it's a valuable uh, it's too valuable to not keep doing you do knock back knock back knock back while they're they're moving up they're new moving up because again it allows us to as soon as possible get ventilation going, um, and I would say that that's my goal is not to not to necessarily make it easier for the firefighters necessarily extinguish a fire it might be that we're lucky that it actually goes out or not really it's just to keep it in check until until we can verify from the inside that we can do ventilation and and I mean, I'm not, I'm not the same, but I mean, PPA came in Sweden, brought back from the nineties from the United States PPA. You know, mm -hmm. it had its glory days and then it died off because people couldn't, and I can't either, people can't judge when is this going to work or not. <laughs> yeah, Some, <laughs> sometimes it works great, sometimes not so much. And right. <laughs> and that's not really a good tactic of, of, of gambling. So, but, no. you know, for me, PPA, you know, PPA, <laughs> it's not PPA anymore, but if you do a transitional attack and put the fan on, um, if you don't have fire spread to other compartments, uh, which is the point of doing the interior check with the tick, uh, I mean you can you can do basically PPA without the, the the risk of the blowback you get with PPA without water. Uh, and that's my goal. I mean that would be ideal. I mean, that, I mean that's, that's my dream scenario. You know, huh? that's part of the US system. Uh, yeah, you know. We we uh, we operate under uh, non mechanical ventilation system, basically just natural opening. So, um, you know, taking every window in a place uh, when you've knocked the fire back and you don't have a real big fire, you just have 
residual smoke now yeah. that that might be seen as uh, causing more damage than necessary you know so I, you know all these things have to be looked at as yeah. on department wide how, how it's going to work you know oh absolutely um uh, one more oh, so what is about one more thing about that one you said something i should have written down <laughs> you have pen and paper you're much more organized than me right uh You said something about uh, the no, I don't remember. It was something about the knockback uh, versus you know knockdown and and oh, well, yeah, basically just it's a lesser form of fire extinguishment. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to come back to you, basically. Yeah, this is the point. So we talked about, uh, you know, the the interior, the, the renaissance sort of, of interior attack, as you, mm -hmm. if you call them different words. And which yeah. is great for me, too, because I think one thing it, it proved to me, a little, sort of all the studies was, um, in a sense, that how important it is to um, have access to all fire compartments. Like, like it is... You stand from the outside during transitional attack and you blow it into the window. You are going to get good results on that for sure if the fire is only in that compartment. Then you will have knockback or if it may be a knockdown, but you're going to get you're going to get suppression if the fire is only in that room. There's I've never seen a study or or have an example myself. I've done an acquired structure burn so many times that I don't have any effect. But if you have extension. Now it's a whole different ball game. You get mm -hmm. partially, but you get not. It, it just comes straight back as soon as you put you you, you stop the stream. So, and that's the same. That's the lesson that transcends into interior attack also. That because my firefighters sometimes, when you do interior attack, it's the same way. You start flowing water inside a room and nothing happens. Go like if if it only were this room, the fire would have gone out. Like mm -hmm. to realize that problem, the interior attack is, is, is having the same problem as the exterior attack. You can only simplify it. You can only have suppression in the room you're actually spraying water. It doesn't matter if you start flowing, you know, having a two and a half inch inside the room. You're not going to do anything good. It, it, it is, a, it is an, an access problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that cleared up a lot of things in my mind as to worse, like tactics. If you, if you, if I, one way of this describing like a more than average fire is just a, a, a fire that's involved in more than one room because right. that because that instantly puts the problem of can i sequentially put water on these rooms without them feeding each other constantly right, right. like and that doesn't matter if it's inside or outside if, if, if i don't realize that if i put water here and then it takes me a minute to go here then I'm going to have the fire coming back again. It's just going to alternate between. I can't sequentially. I have to put both at the same time. And that could be one from the inside and one from the outside, but maybe it's not possible to do it either way, just not. Well, I've, I've had that where we've had uh, two rooms and the engines had to move from one room to the next. And uh, the only way you get ahead of that is you really got to, uh, knock one of them down significantly. Yeah, significantly. And then move on to the next. You, otherwise, you just bounce them back and forth. Yeah. But, you know, you talked about some videos. One of the, and I know you've seen this video, of course, is the... Because uh, <laughs> I'm a nerd? <laughs> is, is, you know, you've seen this video. It's the NIST uh, water... Uh, I forget the actual name, but it's a house. It's a two-story house. NIST did the video a long time ago. They take a, a straight stream nozzle and they put it in a window on the second floor yeah it's and an then, old shabby house with two windows yeah, yeah. yeah. so so they they show how uh you know they blocked the exhaust port of the one window yeah and gases went down the stairs and they lit off okay yeah. and then but the, here's the issue i have with that video and i was surprised they didn't do it as a single room only fire that they did it basically at the same time which yeah. i well i didn't agree with but whatever yeah. it was a you know little video the issue I have, if you watch towards the end of that video, you will see fire in that public hallway of that house. And from the exterior, everything looks wonderful. Yeah. One of my biggest problems with 
outside attack thinking that they're successful while the while the egress point of that house the second floor hallway is on fire and that's a problem so what i wanted from the uh interior attack study was the the transitional attack had made it seem like interior attack was this scary thing that really shouldn't be done you know basically avoid it at all costs so to speak yeah. not everyone but a good portion of people were on that train and then what happens was you see this video and you look and say the only way you find out what the inside what's going on is to get inside you can't make a judgment from the outside you have to get on the inside and then look outside it just it's a better view like you said if you're going to do it from the outside you're going to bounce around you're going to take that one corner bedroom you're going to knock it back then you're going to go around to the other side of the house and you're going to get the one that, like in the ul study those two rooms at the end yeah. of the hallway you're going to yeah, run around you're going to be you're going to be chasing your tail yeah absolutely. when in reality when in reality if you're just in the hallway there you can manage both rooms just by manipulating the hose line oh so, absolutely you know it's just uh i just don't want people to be so worried about interior fire attack and i think the study the uh, fire attack study and this coordinated fire attack study will shed a little bit more light on that just to make just we may never even out the options for some departments that's fine yeah. uh, some will be slanted one way or the other but uh i think we just want firefighters to know what they're capable of doing and and have reasonable assumptions about when to open up and you know better to err on the side of opening up early than late and just uh you know learn what the water does for you inside as well as outside well one thing i definitely agree with is that i don't want i don't want the argument of of going through the window for instance transition hack are, are based on safety because i don't think that is a factor i don't think interior attack is is dangerous um, and and, and there, it, there's very little, if anything, that supports it being dangerous unless you don't have training. Mm -hmm. Like like there's, the, I, I mean, the, firefighting is inherently dangerous, but yeah. if you have even reasonable training, even almost poor training, it seems to be fairly okay. Right. Like the, right. How many firefighters have died with a nozzle in their hands with water? Like there, it's it's very it few. Happen. It does happen, it but does even happen. the nozzle was not open. That's yeah, for sure. uh, it's very few. Very few occasions where you have firefighters died with flowing water. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so 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 there isn't. So so I think that and and what I don't like is that is again internet warriors. You read a lot about people that don't like transitional attack for whatever reason. Use use uh, safety as a way of criticizing me. I said, okay, do, the people who like exterior attack are are the ones who want to make it just about safety, and it's all about it's just a bunch of pussies. And, and I don't like that. It's it's it might be that some people would like to do it because of safety. It might be people like to do it because they don't have SCBAs. I mean, yeah, a lot of places in the world doesn't, doesn't have SCBAs. They don't give, can, can afford it or whatever. I mean, so so they don't have an option. But again, right, for the have, vast yeah. majority of the people debating online, that's not the issue. The issue is, does it make sense from the context of wherever you are, it, you know, in the organization and then staffing and so on? I would argue that it makes sense everywhere on a lot of situations, even New York with a lot of staffing, I, I would argue it makes a lot of sense. If you don't do it as an either or, you do it as a both, you do interior attack at the same time as you do exterior attack, you don't do exterior then interior, you do both. Well, um, we, have, we have incorporated some of it uh, into our basement fires. Um, it's very common now for um, uh, companies to uh, open the line on the exterior through a lower basement window to try and get some uh, knockback on the fire before proceeding uh, down. Let's say the only way is down the interior stairs, taking a little bit of the bite out of the fire to get down there. And that makes sense because um, basements basically have no particular floor plan 
The mm-hmm. ceilings aren't finished. To go above and then down the interior stairs is is risky because you're over a fire you have that's unchecked. Yeah. And again, there might not be any uh, protection between on the ceiling. You know, no sheetrock. So um, we've looked at that, and the companies have looked at it, and they do it. And uh, you know, it makes perfect sense. Whether it would move to other areas of the house is up to the people that respond. Um, you know, we we have we've always had conditions where we would use exterior water, delayed forcible entry, wind hoarding, people trapped, fire coming around you because of you know physical location of yeah. where you're trying to get into a space. So we've always had that. It's just a matter of, um, and of course it is, our lines are controlled by the engine officer. In other words, the nozzle opens on the engine officer's request. So the line has to be charged, first of all, on the outside of the house to do any of this stuff. Yeah. So once that is done, the officer can, could say, hey, give this a shot and then we'll move in. So we've always had the option of doing it. It's not that it's not that it's just um, I think you know, between the internet and what, what makes good noise sometimes <laughs> it can lead us to a false sense of what's really going on. Um, oh, but yeah. like I said, but that being said, we are an aggressive interior attack fire department and we will remain that way because a lot of it has to do with our staffing, our construction and the fact that what we do works. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, well, I could argue that every fire department thinks that what they do works. I've never been to a fire department who says, well, we have, we, (laughs) we have not had a successful working fire (laughs) since 1977. Uh, So I mean, it's very hard, but, but, but building construction definitely and staffing does it. Sometimes you can say like this, there is a, there is a sense of, uh, there's a definite trend. The bigger departments you get to, the more internal, in, inside interior attack they are. That's a, like a generic look at everywhere to go. And that's not strange. I think it's two simple reasons. One, you have more resources, so you allow to do multiple things at the same time. You, you also allow for inefficiency. Like you can be inefficient, but still be effective. Like it doesn't really matter if you have someone placed at a, at a certain point where it's maybe not optimal, but it's good. Like the, the, the smaller departments you go to, the more you have to be like, if someone is standing in a place where it's not, you know, like optimal, nothing gets done. <laughs> like there, there's just nobody else doing it. So there's the, the smaller department are forced to look at the most optimal way of showing it. Another one is just it's larger departments are slower to change because just because of size. So I, th- I think that that's two reasons why you see that generically. But what I, what I wanted to say is that, damn it, <laughs> why did I even start talking about that? Because you said something about, uh, yes, well, yeah, we're going to get context. So in Sweden, um, He's never been, it's never been uh, against the rule to put water in from the outside. Like the transition, the transition attack has never been a rule. Um, if we have never had uh, like, uh, call it a myth or call it a, a truth, but we never had uh, um, uh, the saying that you know, if you put water in from the outside, you're going to push everything against somewhere else or from the uninvolved to the involved and so on. Um, but we do have, if you have firefighters inside, don't put water in because you can steam burn them. That exists everywhere because obviously it's true if you do something improperly. So with that said, but it, it wasn't against the rules or against any, you know, don't do this, put water in from the outside. But we, if you go back 10 years ago, peop, it, it was not done. And it was not done for a simple reason. We never trained on it. We, you know, all all fire training is done from the inter- interior mm-hmm. by law we do two hot hot burns and two cold burns every year that's the minimum you can do to the interior firefighting meaning you do two two hot burns in a live fire building or well, likewise and and you do two cold you know, and those are done interior attack 
So for a very long time, there was no training done whatsoever on anything else, if you, if you gen generalize, on mm -hmm. anything else than interior attack. So what do firefighters do when they arrive to fire? Well, they go interior. They go interior, mm -hmm. regardless of what you t talk about on the PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, so when, when, when the UL study came about the, the transition attack study, exterior attack study, it was, it was a revelation also about, hmm, maybe, maybe we could do this. Like there's nothing stopping us. So that was fairly easy to implement in Sweden. Now, what I found most interesting is how long it took for me to admit that if you put a straight stream in from the outside, it seems to work great. But I was taught that if you just put a straight stream in the ceiling from the inside, it's 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 useless. And it took a long time for me to admit, go like, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute here. <laughs> if it works from the outside, <laughs> maybe it isn't so bad on the inside. So so there is this there is this simple, very simple reason sometimes people don't do things. If you don't train on it, we're not going to do it, regardless if it's it's good or not. And even if it's logically <laughs> doesn't make sense in the sense of me going like I'm going around the United States and teaching firefighters in the United States why it's stupid to use a straight stream. Um, and you go like, yeah, unless it's for exterior attack, then it's great. <laughs> the logical dissidence is so apparent that when you look at it from from hindsight, it's it's embarrassing. So, oh, yeah. I mean, I think the I think the, the water mapping, it, it's it's very simple in a sense, yet it was a component that we hadn't looked at correctly. There were textbooks that showed exterior streams, usually from ladder pipes yeah. or something, you know, hitting a ceiling at a different angle. And, it, you know, the reaction angle is all different yeah. every time they do it. Yeah. And it wasn't based on anything. I don't know what it was based on, but it wasn't based on observation, obviously. <laughs> but, you know, so uh, we have that component. We, 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 well, I, I know I did it at the academy. I would show them, listen, I'm going to put this water on the ceiling, watch what it does. Uh, you know, this is the same effect whether you do it from inside or outside. It's going to be the same. It's, the streams are going to match each other, basically. Yeah. So, uh, for us, I think that knowledge is important for every firefighter to know the water mapping um, because that gives you a sense of how to extinguish a fire and what your water is doing. And, you know, again, like I went at before when we did the uh, the lentil hit, it was like, well, why aren't you doing that on the outside? <laughs> you might end up doing it anyway because yeah. of the smoke yeah. obscuring your vision. You might hit, you might hit that space, but yeah. why wouldn't you do it? And in yeah. fact, if you're not going inside, why not hit the side of the window too and the other side of the window? Yeah. And, you know, we talked about, you know, I get, you know, the message from UL sometimes got convoluted. And I think they're better now putting out a message than they were before. Yeah. But one of the things that, you know, they always talked about the strict um, fact of leaving the stream in place, don't move it around. Yeah. I mean, they meant don't whip it around and obscure the opening. Yeah. That's kind of what they meant. But it was taken as this rigid doctrine that the stream yeah, is a great line and stays like that. And then we were like, all right, well, what if you want to move it around? You know, yeah. can you turn it on an angle and put it in a different direction? Sure you can, because you're going to get a different part that yeah. you didn't get wet before. That, that makes a lot of sense. So if you're going to be outside, you might as well use all the tricks in the bag. Yeah. The thing is, they have to tell people there are other, there are other tricks yeah. in the bag. On the interior, the, the bag comes with a few tricks, and you're basically going to use them all in rapid succession with one another and, and, and get that room knocked down and, and be a physical presence in there and the areas surrounding it. So um, I think the water mapping... Uh, was a very somewhat overlooked component, but I tell you what, um, people love it. I do drills on it all the time. I've been doing it for years before they even had the study, uh, doing uh, hallway attacks and showing people how to move a line down a hallway. So for me, it was a it was a perfect uh, transition, if you will, yeah. no pun intended. <laughs> um, basically, when they did the long hallway, I had been looking at that anyway for years and. Uh, 
so it worked out well. And then the water mapping, it, it just, it's all kind of coming together. And it wasn't that, I think it helps the fire service. Wasn't that like one of those issues where it's sort of look at it, it's too simple. So let's not look at it. And when you look at it, go like, well, sure, this was fairly interesting. This was probably more interesting, like important than we thought. Right. No, I agree. I mean, we we gonna we have um, we we're gonna have a prop uh, for that specifically for that. I mean, we have some areas at yeah. the academy where we can replicate that anyway. But we're gonna get a specific prop uh, built uh, just like they have, and um, it'll be great. It'll just be another step for yeah. firefighters to take to understand what's going on, and it's nice for them to know that. That's good information. That's real good information that they were. In the dark about let's just start. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we, I mean, in Sweden, we we went to fog stream, straight, fog stream gas cooling, and and basically fog using fog everywhere, everywhere, all the time, <laughs> even yeah. when it shouldn't be used. Uh, Thirty years ago, twenty years ago, especially, uh, and so water mapping wasn't really part of the issue because we we as I mean when surface cooling was after gas cools so you cool the gases with fog as then you put squirt a little bit of water on the surfaces to to cool those down it was all in the in the pretext of creating less water damage and so on very good intent in hindsight i would say that it was a little bit um um rainbows and unicorns you know it, it would it would be great if all firefighters were real really good trained um because it's hard to do it correctly and it's hard to do it um at, as a it hard it's very hard to do it correctly safely and as efficient so that you don't create water damages because if you're not good you're going to flow too much water anyway so you're creating water damages but you still have to be good enough to be safe and so on and, and and so you could you could just as well switch to a straight stream and, and whip it around and and as as uh, as one of my my friends said in Canada use the monkey method because you can teach a monkey to do it and that's not true but it's also true because in comparison the straight stream to whip it around in the hallway and if you don't see anything you don't you don't even know where you're aiming so you just yeah, whatever pattern you want to use, if you want to use the over and so on. Mm -hmm. In comparison, it's so much easier to train, which means right. that you can focus on other things than that. You can a moving host line, you know, assessing the situation, communication, coordination, and all those things that are going to make you more skilled. And but because we had fog, fog, and and it's still the 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 dominant technique in Sweden, even though it's it's the straight stream is is, is going to take over more and more. Uh, water mapping again wasn't an issue. It was, I mean, the only thing I learned about water how it hits the surface when I went to fire school was don't use a straight stream in the ceiling because it creates big droplets and big droplets are useless. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I mean, otherwise it was just you know like penciling in the way that we use penciling. Right, After yeah. you've cooled the gases, you just spray a little water on the surfaces to let them cool off. That was right. going around penciling basically, you know, an eighth of a bale, just a, you know, small penciling of surfaces. Right? Like, like use as little water as possible to cool right. the surfaces. That was penciling. It had nothing to do with fire suppression or extinguishment in that sense. Um, and again, I think that, I mean, you, you uh, so th this was uh this this was a, a typical i i need to go soon but <laughs> we could talk about straight stream and smooth bore for a long time i think but i uh, want what what i think it's interesting and when and uh, when the fire tech study came out and and uh you know you all tied tried a bit of smooth bore and, and, and straight stream and fog and of course the result was that uh was that all of them work in the sense that the, that you know you were able to get to the fire compartment and put it out mm -hmm. uh, in a sense and and but the experience was different so the firefighters going with the fog it was much hotter and and you look at timing you know it wasn't faster and you look at you know knock you know return of the fire gases of course much more because you're only doing short pulses so you get this return of water. 
So you start to realize, well, there's a lot of negatives about fog just by lo looking at that study. But mm -hmm. then I get the, the feedback I get from a lot of Europeans was, well, the nozzle operator who did the fog in the UL study wasn't wasn't uh, experienced in doing fog cooling. He just had, wow. had a a brief introduction from John McDonough and you know a couple of hours of the nozzle, and then here we go. And I go like, oh, that you know, you could say that that's valid valid criticism, and then you could say, well, that makes it not as valid in the sense of comparing fog versus straight stream in that context, like just that hallway. Um, but the other one is that if you look at the average firefighter is going to use that fog, they, they I guarantee that Keith, who held that nozzle, knew ten times more <laughs> about fog cooling, probably yeah. than the average firefighter in Europe. Yeah, yeah. No, I and, would agree. With and 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 with the straight stream, I wouldn't say that an average firefighter, if you know, they have, they would probably use the nozzle in the same way as that because it's it's that easy. Kind of thing. So you can't you can't say that well you need an expert straight stream cooler to be very successful. Maybe if you were to come you know, like moving hose line, that's harder, like actually moving and flowing and so on. You need to train more on that. But just the nozzle practice. So for me it was like like if you take again the average firefighter with the fog and average firefighter on the smooth bore uh, or a straight stream. Um uh, it's much easier to see that if you take water damage out of the question, which is a separate issue, if it's an inter important issue or not, depends on who you ask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you take that account, it's just so much easier and it's to do it with the straight stream than with the fog. Um, and I don't like to to say that, but the reality is that most firefighters don't have the skills to 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 use fog to the extent that I think it's a good choice. Well, it always surprised me that, um, from what I I'm aware of, that um, the systems, the fire attack systems that most places outside the United States were using uh, with uh, pulsing or yeah. you know on and off of the stream and to do some sort of evaluation in between that yeah. uh, in conjunction with advancing seemed to me very complicated for uh, for young firefighters to comprehend and the method that we ended up using in the ul study the flow and move portion yeah i wanted that I wanted that. I especially requested it. We had some uh, debates about that internally. Uh, some firefighters didn't want it. Uh, I knew that that was the method we used in New York. And like I said, our proby classes are big. So we have to have a method. And our hose line uh, operation is based on the officer's control. Yeah. So let's look at those two factors as possibly being the starting point. I could be yeah. wrong, but we had to have a system that was easy to teach that was easy to understand easy to replicate yeah. and gave us flow that protected us so we have a system that um enables us to get down hallways flow the line and advance into that fire room pretty successfully the majority of times that we do that so yeah. we had a track record as well so I wanted that in the study and I was fought against that, you know, I didn't get the circles that I wanted, yeah. but I think I'm getting them in the next one. Uh, but anyway, the point was that this is a method that's used by, and I think it's a great method because it takes that responsibility off that young and or inexperienced firefighter and places it on the company officer. And basically there's only a few, directives that the officer has to give the other issue is the line is flowing if something would occur to your right or to your left the line is already open we can take care of it it's not a matter of hey 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 uh, you're shut down at this point you got to open it back up and you know water damage is a byproduct of interior fire attack it just is but that doesn't mean 
that we open the line super far away. We're also cognizant of the fact that if we don't need to open the line right away, we won't. And w- you have to try and find that sweet spot. The other thing that was interesting was that even though the stop and flow was also used, uh, which used less water in the hallway, granted, but was a slower advance, a much slower yeah. advance. So the flow and move created like this corkscrew, basically, of the nozzle team moving down the hallway, cooling the space in front of them, and then eventually getting water into the compartment and putting out the fire. So uh, it worked out very well. It's an easy system to teach, uh, you know, and uh, it works very well for us. And I was very happy to see the results of that. I thought it validated what we do. And really, I don't see anything better out there, to be honest. Uh, maybe others do. I don't do it. Well, I don't. I don't. I mean, I, I, I totally agree that what it what it unequivocally and unquestionably did was it it said that for the Europeans and taking the European standpoint that straight stream gas cooling. Um, because if you take fire tech study and the transition attack study and so on, look at different fire compartments and different room sizes, straight stream works to cool gases, what works to achieve suppression, works to create a safe environment and so on. Because that, that was the premise. His premise was that uh, straight stream gas cooling, not only is it inefficient, it, it is dangerous because it doesn't cool gases effect- effectively, um, which is simply not true. Now, mm-hmm. are there situations where I can see that straight stream is problematic? Yes. I mean, if you don't have a surface to break it up on, it's very hard. Like you, you can't, you can't, like when I do acquire ext- structure burns and you, you get some, I, I remember I was burning a house in Norway just, just a couple of weeks ago. So there's a hallway and on the end of the hallway is a big room and the fire is coming from a kitchen with a 45 degree door angled away from here. So the fire is blowing out here in the hallway and I'm coming from here and it doesn't matter how much I shoot my straight stream. It just goes straight to the fire and all the water end up here. But if I go to a fog, I can just ch- 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 to suppress those flames, get around the bend and then a straight stream up in the ceiling. Now, so, so are there multiple places where I think that, you know, a fog is, is, is better in that case? Yes. Are they important? Probably no. I mean, you can get by with the straight stream also. Again, inefficiency. Now, so, so Dennis, well, we, don't, I, like, we, don't use, we don't use fog nozzles for attack at work. That's the thing for us. So we only have. Yes, I know. Nozzles. I know. We only have one. So, yeah. uh, but you know, it, for us, yeah. we don't have that choice. Yeah. But then it comes to the debate like, if, if there were an optimal, if, if I were to get in a fire, I would definitely have a fog nozzle. And why? Because I have a lot of options. Because mm-hmm. if I go into a smaller space, I just need a couple of poofs of, of fog, and it wouldn't be any water on the floor. I would control that space with, with, with that with that smoke that's in there, and so on. If if I if I go into most compartment sizes, I have no problem controlling that with a fog. <clears throat> I get options. In other options, if I don't want to pressurize a compartment, I go to a straight stream. And when I get into a compartment, I can use a fog again. But that system of, of combining smooth bar or straight stream and fog, even though I would say that that's the most efficient and the most effective way, I don't see it as a realistic way for most firefighters, at least not 90, 90% of all firefighters, because it's too complicated. It requires too much situational understanding of how to place the water and where and when to achieve those outcomes. I'm not well, saying, and I'm not even saying that I'm a super great nozzle operator, but but I'm way better than 95% of the firefighters because I, I, I just practice a lot and I think about it a lot. Sure. So, so I think I, I was in the head, and I think a lot of my European friends that are fire nerds who, I think they're correct in the sense that fog is superior to straight streams if you know how to operate it efficiently or perfectly and if you know to combine it with a straight stream when you have to 
because mm -hmm. you have to use a straight stream a lot of times too unless you want to pressurize a compartment and so on if you want to block that outlet and so on if you don't want to stir things around in wrong situations but i think the the answer is that that's only if you use it perfectly and that's where that realistically if if you take that away the optimal or the best approach is to start with straight stream and if you have time if you have resources over if you want to be really efficient if you have like if i go to oslo a, a wooden city wooden old 1800s wooden city fire mm -hmm. i mean water damage is a major problem because those buildings are not if you if you water damage those buildings they're they're, they're destroyed okay. old 1800s timber like does it make sense that well you teach straight streams but you also teach fog because you have to be able to create better droplets uh, just because smaller fires smaller rooms you just don't want water on the floor is that the norm absolutely not i think that's the exception um and i think <clears throat> um, I'm not the all-seeing eye, <laughs> neither am I the ruler of Europe, <laughs> no. but if you ask me, I think that uh, Europe, Europe is going to adopt straight stream gas cooling as the norm, possibly with add-on as a fog. And that will create the happy medium that America will generically adopt anti-ventilation as a go-to stance to start the incident, as Europe has for all time. So there will be a happy medium where anti-ventilation will be the norm for starting an incident. Then you go for ventilation and then you will have straight stream as the norm. So one for one, Europe versus America, I think is a very happy ending for the fire service as a large, if you do it with the broad paintings, aren't you? It's pretty nice, right? Yeah, no, it's nice. Uh, yes. I mean, you know, I'm glad it's we very broad, help. really broad brushes here, but I mean, well, I'm just, I'm just glad we can help you out. You know, <laughs> no, it's 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 funny. I mean, I mean, we have and, then, and we can talk more about. I think we have, we have the minor disagreements, but I, it's so funny when I, I remember, so you know Scott Corrigan from Seattle. Yes. Do you know a great guy? So he was over for a meeting I organized in Europe. That's the first time I met Scott. And he was showing his smooth bar, you know, nozzle movement and advancing. And I was like, well, mm -hmm. that's very nice if you ever need a big hose line, but why would you need that big hose line? <laughs> right. Which I'm sort of right. true is still, I'm, I'm not convinced that flow is as important as most Americans thinks. But anyway, um, then I went over and I went, um, I did a month tour in the United States what I did a ride alongs. Mm -hmm. So I did in, 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 in various places. I shouldn't mention them here, but but uh, various places and I mean I was a fire nerd. I was I was very confident in what I knew. I still think I'm hundred percent correct. I haven't gotten to the point where I think I everything I know is wrong. And it's very annoying. <laughs> so you con I constantly go to a place where I think everything is correct, but when I look back I have a lot of errors. Okay. So I, I think that a lot of things I know now is probably not true, but I, I still think it's every. I, th I think I have the like the. Uh, it's I, everything I think now is probably correct, but I know it's. I don't like having my stuff proven correct. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I went around in the United States and I and I and I you know like talked about why why people are, um, using straight streams is just not like that. That's makes no sense, and the scary thing is that. And this, this scary and sad part uh, is that I could convince a lot of people that was right. Because the problem in, in the United States, if I'm generic, is that people had the experience that sort of straight stream works, but they couldn't explain it. Because they knew too little about fire dynamics, about water and droplet sizes and heat and everything. So when I when I explain how water works and flows and everything, it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I could explain to them why they were wrong, even though they were right in their experience. 
and they would listen to me and they would go like, well, that makes total sense. We should do the fog cooling. That makes mm -hmm. total sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went home from that trip with a lot of experiences and it was a great time. And, but also like, like I was seriously concerned that, uh, that United States, like the lack of understanding of, 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 of these topics was just mind blowing. Um, and I was convinced that fog, like was, that was just one part of the problem, but like, I, we have to, you know, salvation awaits <laughs> for <Okay>. America. <laughs> uh, and then, and then with, with more experiences and, and, and more studies from UL when transitional attack study came out later and so on. And I started reevaluating my own thoughts and started realizing, well, hey, maybe I didn't understand everything here. Or, or that. again, the scary thing is, and the, the scary is, is with lack of knowledge, which I still is, you know, of like basic fire dynamics and water size, droplet size, and other thing, uh, you can make anything sound plausible. Like you can, you can, you can, you can make up anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just because it sounds good doesn't mean it's true. And just true. because it's, you can't explain it doesn't make it untrue. Um, so, so I, I, I take away with me a lot of those, like, like the experience, the experience, a lot of those, I, I, I wrote in places with very experienced firefighters and they, t they tell me stories about how they perceive the world, but they don't have the words to describe them in a way I can understand it. Right. Like, because they, they don't, they don't, they, they, they look at uh, when I do this, it feels like this. So when I do this, this too happens, look like it's the pressure going that way. They go like, I don't understand pressure. Like I don't right. understand right. flow. Like, right. Right. so by not being able to explain the experiences, they can, they can't convince me that they're right, but they can't teach them further either. Like they, they can't teach a new firefighter to make anything useful of their experiences other than saying, trust me, kid, I'm right. <laughs> like, and that, that, I mean, that, that, that does just go a long way. You have mm -hmm. to have some serious credibility oomph in your back if you're gonna go, trust me, kid. Yeah. Just whip it around with a smooth, straight stream. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know that that that, you know, you, that's uh, also bravado, and you know, that's not an educational format of conversation. You know. You know what I mean? No, but if it is. But if that's the only thing they get, the problem again. The problem is you can be absolutely a hundred percent correct. But if you can't explain it in a good way, um, I, most people won't buy it. Well, because I think they'll buy it in their fire department because that's what they're being taught. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. They might they, have to do it in they that don't case. Really have a choice. Um, but, you know, everybody operates a little differently. Um, that's why I like the idea of the UL study because it, it, it kind of explains what's going on. Um, and to be honest, most fire departments didn't have much interest in fire behavior. Um, yeah. and, and, but I think they are, but I don't know that the way we've been looking at it is the best way either. Um, you know, we have firefighter who goes into an interior fire attack. They can't see anything. There's high heat, uh, you know, and they're moving, they're moving, they're moving into this space. You know, how much does he have to know? How much does he have to know? You could take a brand new firefighter in there and they could put that fire out with a little bit of with a little bit of um, uh, encouragement and knowledge. And that will suffice them their whole career. It's just the way it is. Yeah, um, I, I you know, I, I don't think we're going to make everybody a professor of firefighting. And I don't know that we need to either. I really don't. No, I um, don't. I think you know, you're correct. Like, like running a company, like a management course, 
uh, why would a firefighter need that? Probably wouldn't need that. A, a company officer might need that. But so I think we're going to move into uh, better fire behavior training. But I don't think it's uh, I don't think we should look at the fire service as, um, you know, scorned because we didn't in the past. I think it's just something that's catching up with us. Well, I would I wouldn't say that. I would say the the pro well, we'll say it like this. I totally agree that for most firefighters doesn't have to be experts in looking about fire behavior and so on. Is it good? Well, sure, probably is. Probably it, it might be a also bad because you like analysis paralysis. Right. There's there's if, if, if you're doing something right, just do it. Uh, <laughs> if you just know that you're doing something right. So, so, so I don't think everyone has to be, it's like you said, an expert in fire dynamics and so on. Um, um, especially if you if you have made up ground rules that are safe in a sense. They might not be the most effective ones. They might not be efficient ones, but at least they're safe. Like if you go in a fire, you know, you know do, do flow and flow and move, just flow water against the fire compartment. Are, are, is, are you going to be safe? Probably. Are going to be a lot of water on the floor? Probably. Um, is that That's most what of... moms are for. <laughs> you could say that. Well, I mean, you, I, I, we, look, we, you... I know there's a big difference between uh, the European and yeah. the American uh, with the, the water. And it's always been uh, this thing about the water. And, you know, um, we don't... What's look, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not for excess water yeah. damage, but I'm not going to be crying a river of tears because I put, you know, a couple of gallons in the hallway to get down to the fire room. That's just yeah. part of doing business. And we don't have an issue with that. In fact, I would say for us, we have to be careful of our overhaul water. That yeah. can be wasteful um, when we're, we're doing an overhaul to get the you know final overhaul. I don't think actual fire attack extinguishment uses that much water. Um you know, the UL study kind of quantified how much water we're using. You could use less, probably. You could use more. Um, you know, the big thing for me is just, you know, we want to get the fire out. And whatever I have to do to do that is 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 part of doing business. Some fires you won't use as much. Some you'll use a little bit more, whether it's because the hallway has got a bicycle in it and we can't get around it or whatever it might be or just something, the nozzle firefighter slips, whatever it might be. Um, it is what it is, and uh, it's part of doing business. And I don't worry about water on the floor. Um, and I don't think that should be um, the the milepost, basically, for effective firefighting. I know it, it has a big, it, it's more important. I think, I mean, it is. And it is to me. Why? Well, I mean, there's the most where it is of course if first off you have to be safe and so i mean in terms of and i think that's where most departments are even in europe you have to be safe and to be safe uh you better use too much water than too little so i mean so so most departments are on the i would say and most firefighters are on the skill range of you have to use too much water because you're not good enough to use little water it's well, I would enough. say this, though. I think that, you know, when we did the stop and flow and you, you see the temperature rebound time, it, it, it comes back, but it holds it back for a bit. A lot of times that's all you need is a little bit of, of uh, conditioning to get yourself down to the space. Sometimes you can get very close to the space without putting any water. So um, we just we are not going to I I don't right. see us using water as a benchmark. Give, give yeah. me, yeah, we're going to wrap up in soon, but just okay. give me 30 seconds. I need to check on my kid and then we're going to go back and wrap up. All right. All right. Just give me 30 seconds. Okay. I think it's like two in the morning there for him. Give me a minute. Uh, not yet. He's going to wrap up in a minute. It's like, I don't know what time it is over there, it's Sweden.
What time is it in Sweden? In Stockholm. It's two o'clock in the morning. Unless he's even more than that. He said it was. Oh, it's two o'clock. Six hour difference. Okay. Got a four year old that was a little bit sad. Crisis averted. All right. Yeah, I got to eat my dinner here. Yeah. No. So, so to wrap up on the on just the water damage. So I yeah. think that this yeah. first off is a, I think is contextual ones. Like if I go around in America, not many of those buildings are expensive or worth preserving in that matter. I mean, most are disposable buildings. Um, if I go to a lot of places in Europe, we we're, so. <laughs> what? I agree with that. I don't think somebody. <laughs> A homeowner would agree with that. <laughs> no, no, but in the sense that I mean, it's mo most most buildings in America. No, New York is sort of an exception. There's a lot of old buildings in New York, but a lot of buildings are not. I mean, they're at least fifty years old at, at most. Like, and 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 most buildings are twenty or, th or ten years old. Mm -hmm. Like the, the amount of rebuilding and, and and demolishing. I mean, if you go to a lot of capitals, uh, sort of cities in in Europe, you're talking a hundred, two hundred, maybe three hundred year old buildings at the at the center of them. Right. That's been rebuilt. There, it, you can't rebuild. Like you tear them down and you you get something new instead. You can't rebuild. So there is a contextual difference of of, of like. Not everything is, is is possible to buy with money. Like you go, I got insurance. There's no problem. Go like, yeah, there is a problem. You can't rebuild that. It's it when it's gone, it's gone. So there is this contextual difference that it, basically Europe is much older <laughs> than America. No, I get that. But it's so <laughs> is the fire attack based on? Is it decreed that uh, uh, twenty gallons of water on the floor is going to ruin this building? Yeah. It, uh, it's it it, it it real from experience uh in in, in the insurance company uh, water damage is, is a huge is huge problem like mm -hmm. in america you always heard that, like that nothing like everything dries nothing on burns and which is, is really really not true um yeah sure everything dries but when it has dried it's not okay anymore like you would start getting mold and so on on buildings and, and structural members and so on so it really is not true. Not with that yeah. said, yeah, yeah, there is a context of difference. But with that said, it's been over. It's it's sort of that pendulum that got too far. Now we have in like in rural places, and there's a newer house, and people going in worried about water damages. No, when, if there's a rock and fire in in a newer house, it will get torn down, or or at least majorly torn down it doesn't really matter that much that we're not creating water damages so it's gone overboard in terms of 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 how afraid the fire service is, is of water damages here also mm -hmm. um, so there is again this happy medium where I, again i think like if i go to oslo you know very old wooden construction capital lots of buildings that you cannot replace with money like it, and if you use too much water in one of those apartments, it will soak down to the apartments below, and you will have a ton of problems. Um, mm -hmm. So water damage is, is a major concern. Mm -hmm. So that is that is still contextualized, but it's highly over exaggerated in a lot of places in in in, in, in Sweden and Europe too, especially if you take into account again to be able to be that. Uh, that good to not create enough water damages with for instance using fog and for that matter straight stream too you have to be so good that again most departments can't deliver that because you would have to train with your nozzle you know, an hour two hour every month to know your nozzle what in, in zero visibility what mm -hmm. cone angle do i have roughly how long do i throw my water how much do i need it's not rocket science, but it's definitely not something you would do if you train in your nozzle two times a year, which is what most firefighters does. Um, so I think there's a mismatch between, again, where most fire instructors want the firefighters to be and where the firefighters are, 
and in that case the the method they wanted to use is not is doesn't match anymore uh, so again and that's why i think the water damage i think there's a context differences and i think but on the other hand let's say i think that in america i'm still surprised because there's not if if you go to a if you go to a, let's state an ex extreme example but there's a spectrum here if you go to a um, an industrial fire and the the, the that industri industry is on uh, land where there's a drinking water f fountain or drinking water source under that soil and you go there and you flow that industry with water and it takes all the contaminants in that factory and you flush it down the ground especially if you mix in foam so you reduce surface tension now you flush it all the way down to this drinking water and now you the people in that community is drinking it now that's a serious concern um mm -hmm. like sure. everything we well, flush well, down well, they have industrial fires in this country where uh they've had uh, severe environmental impacts afterward of course yeah. obviously uh, we have a, an issue not far from where I live, where um, firefighting foam was used by uh, federal uh, firefighters, and it's contaminated part of the water supply. So, yeah, but I I don't want you to get the impression that, uh, you know, we're using excessive amount of water without, without any concern, but oh. we're not going to let the concern of water damage lower the safety of our firefighters that that that's the one thing now could a could no, we no i i think that's a that's a false premises oh I, well it could be a false premises cuz i always hear that like more is safer and and i don't think that's well, no true. i think there's a point where more is just more yeah i mean i yeah, i mean i think it's like every i don't think well Given the fact that you have the same amount of training and you put water on the fire and, and, and it's not enough, then more is safer if that is enough. But that's a false, I think, I, the safety is always in, the, in, in deciding, is the thing I have enough? <laughs> if you have 100 liters or if you have 25 gallons per minute and you look at the fire and you go, uh, that's enough, and I go there and fight the fire and it's enough, then I was safe. If you have... If you have 150 gallons per minute and you say, hey, I think I can take that on and it's not enough, then well, it's not safe. There's not a magical number that says, oh, now I'm safe. Meaning, so more more is safer than not, I think is a false premises or it's a false sense of security. The ability to, to, to assess if what I have is enough for safe, being safe, that's safe regardless of the flow you can access so i don't like the premises more is safer i don't like this premises that some countries have a lot of countries have like a minimum for interior, interior attack i don't agree with that at all because it, it's it's it indirectly specifies if i have 150 gallons per minute for interior attack then i am safe or at least safer which is again i think is a false premises um it gives a lot of get out of jail free card. Like, well, I had 500 liters. Or I had 150 gallons per minute. So I'm. Well, I'm... I, I, mean, I think I might equate that to a rope uh, standard. If we had a rope that held 250 pounds, and, you know, do we want to use that? Ropes have breaking strength far beyond what is needed. So I think to have a. a a redundancy in your attack line is not a bad thing. And I, I would say that more than likely our 150 attack line has that redundancy built in. Is it twice as much? Possibly. Um, but, you know, that has to be studied. That's not something I would, I would take a leap at uh, necessarily. I think to go down too low, uh, like you said, it'll work for one fire, but it won't work for the next. We want this to work over... Uh, a varied spectrum of fires and to be fairly successful at doing that, whether it's from a long distance or up close, I don't know that there's any magic bullet number necessarily, but again, I, I would prefer, look, we're inside. Uh, 
we're gonna we have what we have we have this uh thing on our hip that's gonna protect us the hose line and uh i'm gonna use it as much as i need to, to feel comfortable. I, damn it you just open up a new can of, of worms here and i have to go All right. <laughs> damn it no problem. I, I just want to discuss how much flow is needed what's the good attack line why is that one or damn it uh Ray, it's been great talking to you. Uh, 